Welcome to the Manwa world. King Bainas Roche stands with an air of authority. His voice echoes through the grand halls of the palace as he says, I, King Bainas Roche of the Durand Kingdom, solemnly decree the dissolution of our marriage. Our Noah Saliard Cajun. You are hereby stripped of your title as Queen of Duran. As your presence is no longer welcome in this kingdom, you must now return to your home, in the capital of the empire. As a last act of kindness, I intend to provide you with an old carriage for the journey. If you beg him in earnest, perhaps his imperial majesty will allow you to remain within his palace. Blood is thicker than water, after all. He may be willing to put past differences aside and take you back in. His decision to dissolve the marriage is fueled by a mix of frustration and newfound liberation. Arnoa Saliard Cajun, the once queen, receives the news with a mix of shock and defiance. Her noble lineage and pride is wounded. Larissa Estiae, a lady-in-waiting with a hidden agenda, revels in the unfolding drama, her loyalty shifting towards the ambitious pursuit of becoming the new queen. Larissa Estia is asking the king, Oh my. Does she really intend to travel all the way to the capital in a tiny little carriage? I'm nauseated just thinking about it. Larissa is the daughter of a wealthy Duranian noble. And Queen Arnoa's lady-in-waiting. She is allowed the luxury of living in the royal palace as a lady-in-waiting. And is widely known as King Binus's other woman. The king looks at Larissa with affection and calls his name, Larissa. Larissa replied, I understand this is an light-hearted occasion, but I wanted to offer you my support, nevertheless. As a sign of his everlasting affection, King Binas presented Lady Larissa with a special gift. A finely wrought silver tiara. Its centerpiece a black diamond more brilliant than starlight and of a hue deeper than the mysterious depths of the sea. This gem was part of a pair, and the other diamond was embedded into King Binaz's crown. Both diamonds had come into King Binaz's possession as part of Arnoa's dowry. Not a soul in the empire could have foreseen this divorce. It seemed unfathomable that Arnoa Saliard Cajun, sole imperial princess and bearer of the empire's most illustrious lineage would be subjected to such a humiliating divorce. Such a pity to think they'd end up divorced. Larissa, does she not hail from far nobler ancestry compared to the king? King says in a grease of what that, s it she wasn't even worth my time. I should have divorced her sooner. She may have been the imperial princess. There were different voices chattering in the palace as people were whispering in each other's ear, but with her head hanging in shame before his majesty. She appears the same as any other divorcee. This divorce is an embarrassment to the imperial family. Even if she is allowed to return, I'm sure she'll spend the rest of her days locked away in a tower. It would be more fitting to call Lady Larissa our queen. Upon hearing these voices the princesses look sad whereas on the other hand Larissa is looking happy. It was no secret that King Binas did not love his queen but the prevailing expectation was that divorce would be avoided for the benefit of his kingdom. This was a reasonable conclusion. Given that Queen Arnoa was Emperor Luciano's half-sister, and niece of Duke Rickel, who had made a name for himself as a tyrant in the southern regions of the empire, claiming a woman of such noble pedigree as his queen, gave King Binas a sense of superiority he had not been privileged to feel before as a ruler of a tiny sovereign state. That gave him reason to maintain this loveless marriage for two years. But eventually his heart turned entirely in favor of his mistress, Larissa. As Larissa was no longer satisfied playing the role of his mistress, King Binas decided to crown her as his new queen. Of course, it was not an easy decision. Several factors contributed to why their marriage of two years ended in divorce. The first was that he had reason to believe Larissa was pregnant. The second was the queen's sudden change in conduct, which proved to be quite wicked indeed. And the third and final reason, which led King Binas to move forward with proceedings for the divorce, 
was his certainty that the dissolution of their marriage would still leave him in good standing with the emperor. He was assured of this by the emperor's messenger who came to him in the middle of the night, a sorcerer who possessed the cold beauty of a statue. The emperor's messenger came to meet the king and gave him the message of emperor. The emperor will not oppose the divorce between the king and queen of Duran. The esteem in which this kingdom holds the empire has already been demonstrated by your behavior in the past. King thoughts that he's here to discuss the terms of the divorce. Emperor's messenger reveals more information as, the dowry offered by the imperial princess is but a trifle. Compared to the riches stored in the imperial treasury, it would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations between our two kingdoms over such a trivial matter. The king is shocked and he in a state of happiness. Does the messenger mean Tio say? I can end it. The emperor will not demand back Arnoa's dowry even after the divorce? I can part ways with that woman without suffering any consequences at all. King Binas, cold and resolute, dismisses the value of his former queen with a mix of disdain and arrogance. His decision to divorce is not only a personal matter but a strategic move to secure favor with the powerful Emperor Luciano. King to princess standing in the palace, it's time to say farewell. I didn't intend for us to end this way from the start. Perhaps this could have been avoided if you had behaved with a little more resp. If Arnoa had been able to subdue that damned pride of hers just. And if she had clung to him, begging for his love. The night of the wedding. Desiring to snub the haughty princess, Binus sought Larissa's chambers. But if Arnoa had humbled herself. And waited for him, playing the coquette like Larissa always did. The king continued his dialogue then. Perhaps I might have given this marriage a chance. Night after night, Binas abandoned his lawful wife for the embrace of his mistress. But Arnoa made no attempt to stop him, not even once. King whispered in the ear of Larissa who is standing beside him about the princess that, I'm certain she thought I was beneath her. Being a ruler of such a small and powerless kingdom, I see you remain insolent to the very end. I wish never to lay eyes on you again. Go back to where you belong, and leave us in peace. Saying this he throws divorce on princess. The emotions intensify as the divorce document is thrown onto the princess. Arnoa, once proud and regal, now stands broken and betrayed. King Binas, however, remains stoic, convinced of the righteousness of his actions. The twist in the tale comes as Princess Arnoa, instead of crumbling in despair, surprises everyone with a composed reaction. Her apparent joy and gratitude for the dissolution of the marriage leave the court in shock, questioning her sanity. Princess addresses the king, so the deed is done. We are divorced. I suppose there is no need to keep up false pretenses any longer. King Shocking said H.A. what? Princess lifts her head and said since you are not my husband anymore. King furiously said, What is the meaning of this? Princess calmly replied to King, We are officially divorced, are we not? King, I see the news must have been quite a shock, for it seems you have lost both your mind and manners. Princess Arnoa surprises the court with her composure and gratitude, leaving the onlookers bewildered. I know not what you mean. I've suffered enough for the past two years, and I couldn't be more grateful to you for ending our marriage. People in the palace whispering, Does she fail to grasp what's happened to her? Princess, I've endured you and your court for as long as I could. And you've given me precisely what wanted. Allow me to thank you for saving me the... King, how dare you speak to me in that manner? Princess, unfortunately, it appears you are the one. Who fails to grasp what is happening, Binus. King looks very angry as he says... I've never seen her smile like that during our entire marriage. It seems the shock of the divorce has gotten to your head, but may I remind you. Princess made an announcement which left everyone in shock. Bell come out and deliver the emperor's message to the king of Duran. The palace whispers in confusion as Arnoa's true intentions come to light. I ask she insane? 
There is just no other excuse for her behavior. What in the world is she talking about? The introduction of Bell, the enigmatic sorcerer, adds an extra layer of mystery to the unfolding drama. With skin as white as snow and hair. As dark as night. With silver-gray eyes that seem to penetrate the gaze of any onlooker. And a face so beautiful, IT appeared to be chiseled by the gods. It was the very same sorcerer who Binus spoke to the previous night. King Binus was taken aback at the sight of the boy. Upon seeing him, he exclaimed, What is the emperor's messenger doing here? The young messenger, clad in white and black shoes, calmly responded, I came because I was called. Swirling in his light brown royal dress, he continued, Although I feel more like an errand boy than a messenger, did you not hear the new empress call for me? Larissa, visibly stunned, questioned. The new empress? Binas, growing irritated, added, I don't know what you mean. Meanwhile, Arnoa, holding a divorce letter, grinned continuously. Standing beside him, he revealed, Luciano Cajun is dead, the imperial messenger. I am here to announce his passing. Binas, in utter shock, exclaimed, The emperor. Fifteen dead? In anger, he shouted, Nonsense! His imperial majesty is in fine health. The undisputed tyrant and ruler of the empire, the young emperor Luciano Cajun, had no heirs. Binas inquired, If what you say is indeed true, then Prince Arian must now be seated on the imperial throne. The messenger replied, No, Prince Arian is also dead. Adding, They were both assassinated. Servants were shocked, and whispers filled the air. Binas loudly exclaimed, What foolishness is this? How dare you spout such lies about his imperial majesty? Arnoa insisted. The news of his passing is no lie. The message comes from the imperial messenger himself, so it cannot be a falsehood. Binas, deep in thought, pondered, That's impossible, but what will happen if this news is really true? He added, no one could have foreseen such a sudden turn of events. Emperor Luciano was not involved in any known disputes, and he was in excellent health. Furthermore, only a few years had passed since his coronation. He recalled the moment when he, wearing his coat, addressed a servant, saying, I find there is an excessive amount of appointments as of late. The servant bowed and replied, I shall see if any items can be rearranged on the itinerary, your majesty he ordered. We'll discuss this further upon my return. The servant replied, Yes, your majesty. I shall be waiting patiently. In his thoughts, he pondered, making the news of his assassination all the more unexpected. He inquired, Then who will inherit? The boy replied, As the emperor had no heirs, the crown will be passed down to whoever is next in line. He explained, According to your nuptial agreement, the husband would have been designated as the successor of any inheritance that was passed down to his wife. Not just wealth. Meanwhile, Arona stood, twisting her arms and smiling. He added, But any title as well. In other words, you would have been the successor of the imperial throne. Binas and Larissa were in extreme shock. He asked, But that's... And staggered, falling to the ground. Larissa came to hold him, saying, your majesty, the boy continued, if you had just waited one more day, the entire empire would have been yours to claim. However, since you have already acquired a divorce, the imperial throne now belongs to someone else. Binas kept his hand on his mouth and uttered, no. While raising his hand, the boy said, yes, it belongs to none other than her imperial majesty, Arnoa Saliard Cajun. He turned towards Binas and asked, do you refuse to bow down to your new empress? Binas was in utter shock, unable to figure out what was happening. He exclaimed, This can't be. Arnoa started laughing and said, Ha! You heard him, Binas. She added, As your new empress, I demand you show me the appropriate courtesy. Binas got up and said, I refuse to do so. He clenched his teeth and leaned towards Arnoa, screaming, You the empress? That is absurd. Until a moment ago, you were the queen of Duran. 
smiling, Anoa replied. And according to the imperial messenger, I am now the ruler of this empire. Why do you pretend to be ignorant of it? Bainas, irritated and furious, seeing her smiling, said, This is preposterous. Larissa held him, saying, Your Majesty. Arnoa fluttered her hair and said, Hugh, it matters not whether you bow down to me or not. She added, I expected as much from you. Ha, I'm sure you recall that when I married you, I brought with me a carriage full of gold as my dowry. Have it prepared at once. Bainas asked her, What? She added, For I plan to start off on my journey before the day is done, just as you wanted. Seeing her so boldly, Bainas started thinking, Have I ever seen such a cold expression on Arnoa's face before? Arnoa turned towards him and screamed out, Bainas, are you deaf? Don't tell me you meant to divorce me and keep my dowry, too. Bainas started trembling, clenched his wrist, and said, No, I know what I heard. He shouted, The messenger told me the dowry was a trivial matter to the imperial family, and they had no intention of getting involved in such trifles. As he rushed towards Arnoa, the emperor's messenger came in front of him and stopped him, saying, Stay back, he asked Bainas. It would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations over such a trivial matter. Was what I told you. He protected Arnoa and added, Judging by his behavior, I can imagine what your life must have been like as his queen. He twisted his arms and said, Are you still unable to comprehend my message? Any half it would have realized the dowry must be paid back in full in case of a divorce. He asked, Is it not obvious? Binus trembled and denied him saying, Th, that can't be true. He staggered and fell down. Larissa held him, calling, Your Majesty. Arnoa ordered him, saying, King Binus, I shall give you one hour. Prepare a carriage filled with gold. She added, If there is not enough gold in the treasury, scrape off the gilding on the soft walls and spires of the palace, and pick off the jewels on the scabbards of the royal guards. Wait, if after confiscating the royal throne and crown, there is still room left in the carriage, I shall fill that space by cutting off the hair on your very heads. She leaned towards him and said, And of course, the pair of my mother's black diamonds on your heads. I must not forget about those. After saying this, he called the emperor's messenger, saying, Bell! He replied, Yes, your imperial majesty. Your wish is my command. The royal servants started whispering. What's happening there? What will happen now? What on earth is happening here? Larissa hugged him and said, Your Majesty. Binas, what do we do now? He didn't reply. She again asked, Your Majesty? Meanwhile, Belle snatched her crown from her head. Binas screamed, Larissa! She's holding her head, screaming. Act. Binas asked her, are you hurt? Binus screamed out loudly. What is the meaning of this? I've had enough of this insolence. How dare you? Bell held Binus's collar and snatched his crown from his head. Larissa asked him, Your Majesty, are you all right? He said, You may be a sorcerer, but you are nothing more than a lowly messenger. Binus sat down, clenched his hand, and said, King Binus, you have gone too far. He screamed out, This is an insult to the kingdom of Duran. The messenger exclaimed as he snatched the crown from Larissa's head. With a disdainful huff, he added, You remain petty to the very last. Examining both crowns adorned with sparkling diamonds, he continued, You are nothing but a cad who had nothing to give your mistress except for the jewels from your wife's dowry. Gazing at Binas, he questioned, And you have the audacity to talk of insults? In a fit of anger, he flipped off the crowns, causing them to break and scatter crystals and diamonds. Larissa, witnessing the destruction, gasped. My tiara! Black diamonds from the crown fell to the ground. Swiftly, the messenger gathered the black diamonds in his hands and addressed Larissa. Your Imperial Majesty! He smirked while swirling the diamonds in his hands. Arnoa, observing the scene, was astonished. The messenger approached Arnoa, took her hands, and politely stated, I've retrieved them, just as you desired. 
Smiling, he handed her the black diamonds and asked, Does that please you? Arnoa, filled with gratitude, responded, Yes, well done. She touched his face affectionately and declared, Let us leave this place. I've had enough of their foolishness. Meanwhile, Binas fell to his knees unconsciously. Larissa tried to support him, pleading, Come to your senses, your majesty. A concerned servant rushed to Binas and exclaimed, Your majesty, are you all right? Binas, bewildered, uttered, I don't understand. What on earth is happening? Arnoa, smiling, announced, Today has quite possibly been the most wonderful day I have ever experienced. I'd like to see exactly what I've inherited. Arnoa was reminiscing about her past when her brother entrapped her in the tower. In the midnight, the castle was illuminating with lights. Her brother grabbed her hand and said while showing her the castle, Look before you, Arnoa. Arnoa was in grief. He added, Everything you see, this place, the empire, belongs to me. And as your ruler, I hold your very life in my hands. Never forget this fear. You'd be wise to suppress any spark of rebellion or ambition within you. He added, Always remember that your worthless life will be wiped out from existence the minute I let go of your arm. He was her brother, Luciano, her half-brother, who locked her away in a tower as soon as the preceding emperor passed away. Then, as soon as she turned eighteen years old, she was married off to the king of Duran. She added, Looking back, there was not even a valid reason for the marriage. Binas, the king of Duran, was more interested in my dowry than in me. After marrying him, she started thinking, but I found comfort in the fact that marrying him at least allowed me to be freed from that tower. I convinced myself that a little infidelity would not shake me. I only had to suffer through his efforts to shame me a few times a week, which I found tolerable. Then, Larissa came into her life. However, we were fated to be together. I've never loved another woman in my life. Binas was holding Larissa's hand and saying to her, Promise me you'll always stay by my side. Larissa. She replied, Your Majesty. I'm speechless with happiness. It was their wedding day. Larissa was dressed up in a pink royal dress. All the guests praised them. They make such a handsome couple that I feel a bit envious. They truly are a winning pair. Meanwhile, Arnoa stepped in holding two glasses of wine. Everyone got shocked to see her. She said, Your Majesty, may I take my leave now? Binas turned towards her and asked, What are you still doing here? Larissa reminded him, Do you not recall your majesty? You asked her majesty the queen to wait with our wine glasses. She hugged him and said, So that you could have the first dance with me. Binas snuggled her and replied, Oh, yes. I see my queen has faithfully carried out my request. He scoffed at her and added, I didn't realize you were so obedient. It's not as if you're some servant. I thought you'd have more dignity than that. Larissa asked Binas. Whatever shall we do, Binas? I'm afraid Her Majesty had no idea. She added, That you wouldn't drink that wine anyway since it's been sitting out for too long. You've always preferred your wine chilled. Larissa, the daughter of Count Estiae of Duran, the Queen's chief lady-in-waiting, the King's first love and current mistress. On seeing them together, Arnoa started thinking. I thought it was strange that I was given a lady-in-waiting so soon after my marriage. He just needed an excuse to keep Larissa close by. Arnoa placed wine glasses back at the dish and said, Then I shall return to my chambers as I am not feeling well. Meanwhile, Binas interrupted her by saying, What a shame. Larissa wanted you to enjoy the festivities with us. Larissa screamed out with excitement. Yes, we don't mind your presence here at all. She started rushing towards the stage and added, Please, you'll stay a bit longer. She sat on a chair and asked, Won't you? Binas was standing beside her chair. She taunted Arnoa by saying, Although, you'll have to stay on your feet as there is no seat for you here. Arnoa left from the wedding running towards her room. She thought, Are all marriages this horrible? Where did we go wrong? She reminded, Was it on our wedding night when Binas left for Larissa's chambers as soon as the ladies-in-waiting were dismissed? 
At that time, when Binas said to her, Or was it when I overheard his lies about the night we didn't even spend together? The imperial princess was not so high and mighty standing naked before me. If I had to evaluate her, she'd receive the lowest marks. She got trembled at that moment. She thought, or perhaps when Binus said, Larissa will remain in charge of household matters. If there is anything you need, be sure to get her approval first. She thought that. And there was also when she stepped on her dress and fell down. Binus scolded her by saying, Are you blind? Larissa lost her balance because you stepped on her skirt. Thank heaven she did not fall. Arnoa squeezed her dress and thought. Binus has always been an imbecile. Despite the challenges, I could bear it all, as long as it meant I could escape that tower. She reminisced about her past when her brother entrapped her in the tower. My half-brother Luciano despised me since the day I was born. Perhaps that was because he was envious of my mother's noble lineage, which was more powerful than his own. This was understandable, as my mother, Anastia, was the matriarch of the Rickle family before her marriage to the emperor. She added, Father had always been of delicate health. After his death, I must have become a thorn in Luciano's side. Knowing this, I tried to keep out of his sight, staying with my mother's side of the family. But he dragged me to the palace as soon as he ascended the throne and locked me away in that tower. Yes, I'd rather be there than remain confined in that place. I would have willingly forgiven Binas for his senseless behavior. She twisted her arms and thought, except when he gave away that tiara and the jewel that adorned it. Those diamonds were a keepsake from my mother. She also received them as a gift from father when they were young. She added, So the value of those precious diamonds was already well known in high society. And of course, they were a part of my dowry. When I first saw Larissa wearing that tiara, I was furious. But after fury came fear. She disclosed her father's intentions, saying, when Count Estia saw his daughter at the king's side, wearing the tiara embedded with that famous jewel, he aspired for his daughter to become queen. Since that day, I have been a target of ongoing assassination attempts. She added, Aside from being fed poisoned food, I lived under constant threat of attack. I could hardly sleep at night for fear that assassins would break into my chambers through the windows. I could die at any moment, so I lived in terror. Realizing Duran was no better than the tower, everything felt futile. Arnoa put her hand on her head, took a sigh, and said, How much more can I take? I'm at my wit's end just surviving day to day. While opening the door, she started thinking, What can I possibly do to change any of this? I'll just toss more firewood in the fireplace for now and get a good night's. She saw a white beast in front of her and got astonished. Huh! What's this? She thought. Why is there a beast fast asleep in my chambers? Is this the Count's new plan to kill me? She stepped forward, thinking. Since the assassin he sent last time got caught, perhaps his new plan is to set a wild beast on me. Still. The beast was sleeping, and suddenly he flicked his eyes. My goodness. I've never seen such an enormous animal. Arnoa was thinking. It's rather beautiful. The beast growled, and she got scared. Meanwhile, she slapped her head and realized. What was I thinking? Did the fatigue go to my head? She panicked and started rushing towards the door to escape. This is not the time to gawk. I should go out to the corridor and ask for help. She hurried towards the door in an attempt to escape. As she rushed, panic set in. Meanwhile, the beast awoke and lunged at her. Upon hearing its footsteps, she turned around, visibly terrified. In a matter of seconds, the beast charged at her, causing her to fall, with the creature standing over her. In the grip of fear, Princess Arnoa questioned her fate as the leopard held her. How can this be? Am I to die like this? Suddenly, the leopard underwent a mystical transformation, morphing into a human figure. The sorcerer, revealed to be Belle, stood before her and asked her, Is it you? he questioned. Princess, bewildered and frightened, could only manage to ask, What on earth is happening? He's a sorcerer. And seeing as he is able to polymorph, 
He must be a very powerful one at that. What could he possibly be doing here? Sorcerers are known to keep to their own kind in the territory of Prehen. Answer me. Are you Arnoa Saliard Cajun? Sorcerer demanded. The princess, nodding her head in acknowledgement, awaited an explanation. All right, then on to business. Here, this letter is for you, he said, handing her a letter. Princess, still bewildered, questioned. A letter? Who would dash? As she took the letter from the sorcerer. Sorcerer, I was told he was a friend of yours. Could it be? Princess, reading the letter which says, Tell me whenever you wish to leave Duran. I'll find someone from the academy to put a curse on King Binas. She muttered, Anakin? Did Anakin send you here? Sorcerer, indeed he did. He was always an arrogant pest, even when we were students at the academy. Keep reading. The princess continued to read Anakin's letter with shock. My dearest friend Enoe, the emperor and his successor have been assassinated. I've sent you a gift. Knowing you, I'm sure you'll be able to use it wisely. I sincerely wish you the best of luck. Your loyal friend, Anakin. A assassinated? Drat! Princess Arnoa exclaimed, shocked at the news. Both of them, at the same time? But that's impossible. The sorcerer interrupted, stating, That isn't even the real concern. Princess, now contemplating her situation, murmured, If the emperor and his next in line are both dead, that means I'm the only heir left. However, her thoughts drifted to her marriage vows I. Arnoa Saliard Cajun, do hereby solemnly vow to become the Queen of Duran, pledging faithful obedience to my husband, agreeing to transfer all worldly wealth and titles under his name. Realizing the complications she thought that, I am bound by my marriage vows. The emperor already had a successor, and I did not expect any title to be bestowed upon me. Regardless, the emperor and his successor are both dead, which means that imbecile will become the emperor. Were you and your brother on close terms? Although, you do look more angry than sad for that to be true. The sorcerer inquired, curious about the princess. My mind is preoccupied with various matters, that is all, he said, sensing the emotions of princess. As the princess continued to read the letter, she found a line that caught her attention. I've sent you a gift. Is that the only explanation you're giving me, Anakin? So where is it? She questioned. Where is what? The sorcerer responded innocently. My gift, she pressed further. Are you disappointed that I came empty-handed? Perhaps I should have prepared a gift as an offer of my condolences, he teased. And oh, that is not what I mean. Do you truly have nothing else to give me? She clarified. And oh, I do not, the sorcerer affirmed. The princess, skeptical of the sorcerer's response, thought, he appears much too composed to have taken the gift for himself. Anakin must have had a reason for sending this letter. A letter and a sorcerer, at any rate. And asked the sorcerer about the circumstances that led him there. I was simply trying to be a good friend. The sorcerer explained. A good friend? According to Anakin, there existed no such thing as a good sorcerer, at least not within the halls of the Academy of Magic. If a non-sorcerer desires something from a sorcerer, he must always pay a price. He replied, I'd rather not delve into specifics. She interrupted, Or perhaps you were challenged to a wager. He turned, looking at her with anger. She smiled and said while holding the letter, It appears I am correct. A sorcerer's wager mandates acceptance if challenged by citing their full name, as ordained by the sorcerer's code. Arnoa emphasized, Winning the wager is no easy task. Sorcerers have lengthy, difficult names, and even if one were able to overcome that obstacle, most people end up losing the wager, paying the price with their life or losing something precious to them. However, Anakin was unlike most people. Expressing irritation, she stated, No surprises there. Then looked at the letter, pondering, But why? Why would Anakin challenge you to a wager? The boy smirked and replied, I can't say for certain myself. 
Arnoa contemplated. Anakin's letter said the Emperor was dead, and the role of announcing his passing has always been reserved for the master of the Enchanted Tower. As the boy smiled at the situation, Arnoa realized and exclaimed, You are the master of the Enchanted Tower! He confirmed. It appears you truly are as clever as they say. Adding, That is correct. I am here to fulfill my duty as the Imperial Messenger. Now where may I find a fellow named Binas? I must make myself useful to the Empire by delivering the news to him. Arnoa, serious, questioned. Did Anakin tell you to come to me before you met Binas? He affirmed. Yes. Placing the letter on the table, she presumed. I presume you'd decline if I were to seek a favor from you. He responded. Well, of course I would. It is no simple task to persuade a sorcerer to do your bidding. Concerned, she declared. Then I'm afraid I must challenge you to a wager. On hearing this, he sighed. A wager? How will you go about doing that when you don't even know my... He flinched when Arnoa added. Belcherius Dion Askel Rupilation Perhen Nerudi. Astonished, he questioned. What? She clarified. That is your name, isn't it? Belcherius Dion Askel Rupilation Perhen Nerudi, called Bel for short. Irritated, he turned, saying, Ugh, Anakin, that sly bastard. She insisted. Now you must join me in my wager. Arnoa continued. The last thing I want is for Binas to sit on the imperial throne. If I win. Bell stood up from his chair, and she slipped the letter out of her hands, declaring, I shall acquire a divorce and become the empress myself. The letter dropped on the ground. Princess Arnoa, with a fire in her eyes, expressed her grievances. What was my recompense for allowing Luciano to lock me away in that tower, and then consign me to a marriage that was no better than exile? The servants under my command disappeared one by one, having been falsely accused of treason. I was the scapegoat of Luciano's rage and violent temper. Then I was subjected to Binas's mockery, and now my very life is in jeopardy as Count Estia aims to have me assassinated. Luciano was the cause for all my suffering, and yet the fool died without even a successor. At this rate, Binas will ascend the imperial throne, and I shall become a nameless queen destined for even more humiliation. I must attain the sovereignty for myself. Turning toward Bell, the imperial messenger, she declared with authority, And you, the imperial messenger, shall acknowledge me as the new empress, the twenty-eighth master of the enchanted tower and ruler of the territory of Perhen. In the halls of the palace, Princess Arnoa contemplated the mysterious figure before her, Bell, the master of the enchanted tower. She recalled the whispers and tales surrounding him. Bell, the master of the enchanted tower, she mused. I have heard some unverified rumors regarding him before. As the imperial messenger, Bell stood with an air of enigma. His unparalleled magical prowess was inherited from birth as the son of the esteemed sorceress Amaryllis, the twenty-sixth master of the enchanted tower. Despite his position as an imperial vassal, he remained elusive much like many sorcerers who tended to live in seclusion, isolating themselves in a territory even the emperor dared not govern. They only emerged from their isolation to fulfill their duty as imperial messengers, honoring a covenant established in ancient times. Princess's mind wandered to the past, remembering a conversation with Anakin. Anakin had shared insights about Bell. One of my schoolmates is exceptionally talented. Intrigued, Princess inquired. Oh, do go on. He's a genius, yet he has no friends due to his horrible temper. He makes wagers with other students, depriving them of their wealth and magical powers, thereby rendering them unable to live as sorcerers any longer. Anakin explained, admiring the bravery of Bell. Shocked, Princess questioned. What? How can he be allowed to attend the academy after committing such misdeeds? Anakin continued. He was expelled, although it's uncertain whether it was due to his notorious behavior. He is said to have returned to Perhen after that, inciting the previous master of the Enchanted Tower into a duel, emerging victorious, and claiming the tower for himself. 
As the pieces of the puzzle came together in Princess Arnoa's mind, she couldn't help but feel a mixture of curiosity and caution towards the enigmatic sorcerer standing before her. Belle broke the lingering silence, interrupting the princess's inner thoughts. Your proposal is absurd. Do you even realize what you would be forfeiting if I won the wager? Belle questioned with a hint of skepticism. Our wager becomes official once you state what you desire from me, does it not? Princess responded calmly. Belle observed her demeanor. She appears not to be afraid of me at all. If she has heard anything of my reputation, she should behave with more caution. He thought. You are after my soul stone, the princess asserted. Are you truly willing to relinquish it? Pray, do you have any understanding of how it is made? Belle inquired. I do. Half of my life will be drained, forming a beautiful jewel. It cannot be taken by force and must be given willingly. There exists a tiny bit of magical power in every soul stone, but the most powerful stone is one which is created from the life force of an imperial. Sorcerers use these stones as a source of power, explained the princess. Yes, you are well aware of its purpose and at what cost it is made. However, I am sorry to inform you that I cannot kill the king of Duran so that you may become the empress. The founding emperor of this empire was no fool. Bell clarified, highlighting the limitations imposed by the spell on the imperial messenger. Your offer is quite tempting, but I cannot accept this wager, as it does not offer any possible gains, Bell asserted. But there is no provision that dictates when the news of the emperor's death must be delivered, is there? Princess suggested. While that is true, I prefer to rid myself of this hindrance as soon as I can. If there is longer than a month's delay in delivering the news, the succeeding emperor may hear it from another source, and that would be quite embarrassing for me. Bell explained. Fine. All that I ask, the princess tapped the table with force, is for you to delay fulfilling your duty for just one month. Why? Bell questioned. So that I may acquire a divorce in the meantime, the princess declared. Acquire a divorce? Bell echoed, surprised. Yes, that is what I wish to wager, whether or not I am able to obtain a divorce and claim the throne for myself, princess stated. In other words, you win the wager if you are divorced within the month, Bell summarized. Yes, and if I fail, I shall give you half of my lifespan. If I win, I shall become the new empress, and all that would be required of you is to fulfill your duty by declaring the news. Therefore, you stand to lose nothing even if you fail, the princess explained confidently. Then this wager has no merit. You dare to challenge the master of the enchanted tower, yet seek no compensation? Bell questioned. You need not look so offended. There is merit in this for me as well. In order for the wager to proceed, announcing the news of the emperor's death must be delayed. Not only that, but if you want my soul stone, you will have to prevent any harm from befalling me, no matter how brash my behavior may be, Princess reasoned. It appears you have ensnared me in a rather curious scheme. The wager was just a ploy to gain my support, was it not? Belle concluded, applauding the princess's strategic thinking. The princess merely smiled in response, her plan unfolding before her. The memory of a play orchestrated by the king to mock the princess lingers. Princess Arnia is vividly reminded of the painful spectacle. Nass! How dare you seduce his majesty! There is only one person who deserves to be by his side, and it's me, Arnia! The princess exclaims, snatching Nanissa's hair. Nanissa pleads. Your majesty! I shall bear the blame for it all, but please, have mercy on my unborn child! She staggers, uttering desperate pleas. King intervenes sternly. Nanisa! Speak no more! Princess Arnia tries to play along, proclaiming her devotion, but the king silences her with a sharp command. Hold your tongue, Arnia! The king dismisses the absurdity of the play. This is ridiculous. Prospects for Duran's artistic pursuits appear bleak, indeed. As the princess reflects on the humiliating performance, she recalls the audience's applause and the sinister motives behind it. 
This play was written to humiliate me, and I have no choice but to applaud. Is this their idea of amusement? The audience's reaction is mixed, with some clapping enthusiastically, while others murmur about Count Estia's relentless pursuit to make his daughter a queen. The princess wonders when the public will tire of this farce. Despite the disclaimer that the play is a work of fiction, she can't help but find the actor's name, Rick Tavian, suspiciously familiar. When will the public tire of this ludicrous play? Ahem. This performance was written as a work of fiction, unrelated to any real people or events. Could they have picked a more obvious name? Whispers circulate within the audience, discussing the male actor's rising reputation. That male actor has been making quite a name for himself. But of course, he's Rick Tavian, after all. There are rumors of Count Estia's illegitimate son, performing in cheap melodramas, fueling speculation about the actor's true identity. The king, reveling in the mockery, acknowledges the actor. I was quite impressed with your acting. Your eyes were very expressive. The performer stammers out his gratitude. Th thank you, your majesty. To further humiliate the princess, the king turns to her, smirking. What say you, my queen? Was there any line in the play that you found particularly memorable? Perhaps you'd like to recite one of the queen's lines for us. That would be quite amusing, indeed. Ha! Huh. As the royal court gathers for the commencement of the play, tension is palpable between Princess Arnoa and King Binus, with Larissa observing the unfolding spectacle. Princess Arnoa, seizing the opportunity, addresses the king. As you wish, your majesty. If you'll allow me, would it be all right if I received some assistance from the star of the play? The king, wearing a smirk, responds, Please do. I must say, it has been ages since you have shown such enthusiasm. Rick, you may step forth. Rick, the star of the play, nervously approaches. It is an honor to make your acquaintance, your majesty, he says with a nod. Princess Arnoa, with a mischievous glint in her eyes, instructs Rick to come closer. As he hesitates, she demands even more proximity, causing discomfort. It is true what they say. You truly are the most handsome man in all of Duran. You are just as I imagined you would be, she declares, leaving Rick shivering. Princess Arnoa continues her theatrical performance. You carry yourself with such a majestic air that those in your presence cannot help but lower their heads in admiration. None can wear that deep purple hue with more grace than you, your majesty. King Binus trembles with anger as the princess proceeds to place a ring on Rick's finger. This rich purple shade is the symbol of Duran's royalty. It is a color suited only for the bearer of this crown. Rick, now visibly distressed, stammers. Th this color symbolizes royalty. Only a person of royal lineage may wear purple. The audience begins to murmur. The princess, playing up the charade, slips the ring onto Rick's finger, stating, You are entirely correct, of course. That is why I wish to present you with this ring, whose elegant color suits you perfectly. Kindly accept it as a heartfelt gift from me, Arnoa. She quickly corrects herself with a smirk. Oops. Oh, it was Arnia, wasn't it? My apologies. I must now bring this act to a close. King Binas, seething with anger, questions the sanity of the queen. Has the queen lost her mind? Princess Arnoa continues talking to Rick. You may keep that sapphire ring as a gift for putting on such a fabulous performance. Rick, startled, attempts to remove the ring and he says, Your Majesty, I will take off this ring right this instant. The audience reacts with shock. Larissa tries to intervene, claiming Rick had no intention of wearing the ring, but King Binas has heard enough. He snatches the ring from Rick, ordering, Get this scoundrel out of my sight! Rick pleads for forgiveness, but the king remains firm. Princess Arnoa, unfazed, glares back at the angry king. Glare all you want. You would not dare lay a finger on the imperial princess. As the guards escort Rick out while he screams for mercy, King Binus, frustrated, declares, I shall return to the palace at once. Larissa rushes after him, but the princess, contemplating the unfolding chaos, thinks, What has Larissa Estia gained from being Binus's first love? 
He mocks others all he likes but cannot stand being mocked in return. How can someone with such a self-centered attitude possibly rule over an entire empire? I managed to wound his pride, but that is hardly enough reason for a divorce. We shall see who prevails in the end. With a smirk, she moves away from the scene, leaving the palace in a state of turmoil. On the next beautiful morning, the sounds of chirping of birds have surrounded the palace, the royal trio, King Bainas, Princess Arnoa, and Larissa, sits at the breakfast table. The king reads a newspaper article praising the yesterday's play and performance of its main lead character named Rick and Princess, and the newspaper illustrate the exact dialogues of Princess about the main lead as the most handsome man in Duran, able to wear the color purple with grace and possessing the majestic air of a king. King Bainas, unimpressed, exclaims, This is absolute drivel! He flaps the newspaper dismissively. Princess Arnoa, with a mischievous gleam, pokes the king, asking, What is the matter, Binus? Were you not the one who wanted me to recite the lines from the play? The king, clearly irritated, retorts, As it appears you have entirely abandoned any sense of propriety, I must remind you that you are a queen, and I expect you to behave accordingly. Even if you were raised a naive princess who knows no better, Undeterred, Princess Arnoa continues cutting her steak, smirking. You need not remind me of my title. I couldn't possibly forget, as Larissa has been relentless in her quest to seize it from me. The king falls silent out of anger, and Larissa intervenes, trying to ease the tension. Your majesty, her majesty, the queen, seems a bit irritable today. Let us not concern ourselves with her and continue enjoying our meal. Here, would you like a taste? This is my favorite. Larissa lifts a piece of meat from her plate. King Binas, touched by her gesture, responds warmly. You are as kind as you are beautiful, Larissa. I shall let you have the first taste. Larissa takes a bite and expresses her enjoyment. It's delicious, your majesty. Princess Anoa, observing the exchange with a glance, decides to take her leave, saying, Ha! I shall take my leave now. As she departs, King Binas and Larissa share a moment, appreciating the delightful meal. The atmosphere lightens, and the king exclaims, I'm certain it's delicious. They continue to enjoy their breakfast, seemingly unaffected by the earlier tension. In the quiet recesses of Princess Arnoa's memories, a poignant conversation between her and her mother resurfaces. Princess Arnoa's mother imparts wisdom. Remember Noah. In order to win a servant's loyalty, you must only give one your undivided attention. A young and curious princess Arnoa inquires. Pardon me? Her mother, sensing the innocence in her daughter, asks. Are you all grown up? Princess Arnoa hesitates before responding. No. The mother continues her guidance. Then are you wealthy? Just like your father or uncle? Or even myself? Princess Arnoa understanding her modest circumstances, replies, No, I'm not wealthy either. The mother leans in, sharing a profound truth with her daughter. I shall tell you something very important, so I want you to listen closely. Wherever you go, seek just one person who has the greatest potential to be your aid. The young princess, absorbing this advice, seeks clarification. Just one person? Her mother nods, emphasizing the significance. Yes, choose the smartest of the bunch. The smartest, and give that person all of your trust and affection so that they would even risk their life for you if you so desired. Tenderly, she pats Princess Arnoa's head, leaving an indelible impression. When you lack power, that is the only way to gain an ally. In a quiet moment at the royal table, Princess Arnoa and Belle engage in conversation. Princess Arnoa reflects, Mother was absolutely right. Bell inquires, and your choice was Dr. Ludes? Princess elaborates on her decision. Correct. In a foreign kingdom with so many enemies, what one person could prove most useful to me? They would need to be able to detect any poison in my food, protect me from illness, and at times, even aid me in keeping my enemies in check. In other words, a physician. She wasn't the court physician but an apprentice. Dr. Lude stood out from the rest. 
She came from a family of scant means with many mouths to feed. And most importantly, she was a genius. Sorcerer Bell probes further. But is she truly poor? Royal physicians are paid handsomely, are they not? Princess clarifies. Not in the case of apprentices. In addition, her mother fell victim to an incurable disease, and Dr. Ludes was in desperate need of money for her treatment. The conversation shifts to a memory of Princess Arnoa discussing plans with Dr. Ludes. Princess expresses gratitude. You have been an indispensable help, Dr. Ludes. Dr. Ludes replies, It was no trouble at all, Your Majesty. I'd do anything to please you. Princess discusses the contraceptive medicine. The contraceptive medicine you concocted worked wonderfully on Larissa. You may stop administering it to her now. Dr. Ludes questions, Is it no longer a concern whether she becomes pregnant? Princess reveals her true intentions. Actually, I need her to show symptoms which indicate pregnancy. Dr. Ludes asks about the timeline. How soon do you require her to have such symptoms? Princess sets the deadline. I need her to be diagnosed in three weeks' time. Are you up to the challenge? She punctuates her request with a smile. Dr. Ludes confidently responds. Of course. I'll get started on mixing the ingredients right away. Sorcerer Bell acknowledges. Quite competent, indeed. Princess concludes the discussion about Dr. Ludes. As I told you, Dr. Ludes is a genius. I would not be alive to converse with you like this had it not been for her help. I'm sure Larissa is at a loss as to how I managed to survive all of her attempts to poison me. In a flashback, Larissa frustratedly questions her helper. Is this the best you can do? You told me she ingested the poison without a doubt. Why is she still alive? In the midst of their conversation, Bell drops an unexpected revelation. Bell asserts, No, not the physician. You. Princess, taken aback, exclaims, Me? C.A. Call. Bell, maintaining an air of mystery, states, I must step outside momentarily. With a swift movement, he springs up. Princess, puzzled, questions, What? But where are you going? Bell, already in motion, leaps away. Princess, left with bewilderment, mutters, He just comes and goes whenever he pleases, as if he were some kind of alley cat. In a mysterious jungle setting, Bell engages in an unusual conversation with an animal. Bell scolds, You were moving at a snail's pace. Did I not tell you to carry out your tasks promptly? Surprisingly, the animal transforms into a human, revealing Luca. Bell, unfazed, states, Luca? Luca, with theatrical flair, exclaims, You are too cruel. Do you really intend to nag me after all the time we've been apart? Are you not glad to see me? Bell, pragmatic as ever, replies, It has only been two days since I last saw you. Luca, dramatic, sighs, Well, it was the longest two days of my life. Ha! Cutting through the banter, Bell demands, Enough with all this chatter. What do you have to report? Luca, back on track, says, Oh, right. Ahem. There was a letter from Perhen. This time, a boy from the Lopen family is showing the signs. Bell acknowledges, Yes. I also heard that on the way here. What else? Luca, with a mischievous grin, adds, Oh, if you wish to hear some news regarding the Queen of Duran, during your absence, she drove an entire theatrical company to ruin. Bell, surprised, questions. What? Did she truly manage that in the span of just two days? Luca nods. Yes, she is quite a terror, contrary to her appearance. Bell, unfazed, inquires. Have you captured it in the artifact? Luca proudly presents the artifact. I have it right here. Although it is a bit blurry. I'm sure you're already aware, but Anakin always claims the entire stock every time new artifacts become available. Bell examines the artifact and comments. Wasn't she amazing? I witnessed the whole ordeal hidden just off the stage. The queen knew exactly the effect her words would have. It appeared to be all part of her plan. Luca agrees. Hmm, she certainly is competent. 
As Belle hands back the artifact, Luca adds, She desires to become the new empress, eh? She is better suited for the position than that fool, Luciano. Uh, Master Belcherius? Belle responds, Yes? Luca, alarmed, points at the palace. I'm afraid I just saw. A tense moment unfolds as Luca reveals. A band of assassins headed for the palace. Princess, unaware of the unfolding danger, greets Belle. Oh, Belle! Your back dash. Suddenly, chaos ensues. Dart! The scene is filled with the sounds of whooshing, thudding, and splashing. In the midst of chaos, the sounds of assassins causing harm to the princess echo through the room. Belle remarks, It appears the palace guards are remiss in their duty. Where have they all gone? Princess, determined, says, Yes, I expected as much. Judging by this sudden appearance of dagger-wielding assassins and how they leapt three stories without a moment's hesitation, I was right. The guards were instructed to abandon their posts. Their relentlessness never ceases to amaze me. I am the Queen of Duran. Is this the treatment I deserve? Belle, concerned, notices. You are hurt. Princess tries to downplay. Uh, oh, it's nothing. I'll just have the wound cleaned and have Dr. Ludes take a look at it in the morning. Belle firmly insists. Hold still. The princess questions. Do you also possess the power to heal? Belle, with a touch, replies. Only as much as needed in the present. Is this Count Estia's doing? To make his daughter a queen? Princess nods, indicating yes. Bell, with a suggestion, says, Would it not be simpler to have the king killed? Princess, shocked, responds, What? Bell continues, It's true, is it not? King Binas is what's in your way. All of your troubles will be solved if he ends up dead like Luciano and Arian. Have you not attempted to because I refuse to do it for you? Princess denies, No. Bell persists, with Dr. Ludz's help, surely you could. Princess interrupts. That's not it. Belle, intrigued, questions. It can't be because he's your husband? Princess clarifies. The reason I cannot do it is because Binas has a nephew who is his successor. Belle, surprised, asks. A nephew? Princess confirms. Yes. Meaning if he dies before the divorce, I will be nothing more than a widowed queen. It would be a sight to see to have that unruly brat seated on the imperial throne. What a headache that would be. Bell, pondering, says, Then have that ten-year-old taken care of first. Princess covers his mouth, warning, You are forbidden from inflicting any sort of harm on Dr. Ludes, Binas, or his nephew unless I give you the word. If you kill anyone without my permission, I will consider it an act of sabotaging our wager and you can forget about receiving a soul stone from me. Belle, realizing the situation, agrees. Ah, uh, yes, we had a wager. It completely slipped my mind. That's... Princess asserts. We shall proceed on my terms. Belle adds. Fine, but I also have a request. He slips a mystic eye into her hand. That is a mystic eye, isn't it? Why are you giving that to me? Belle explains. It's the only artifact that allows a particular enchantment to be cast on it. That gem is part of a pair. When one gem is worn, it allows the person who dons it to witness the actions of the person wearing its counterpart. Always wear it around your neck. Princess expresses gratitude. Thank you. Belle, looking alert, says, Your Majesty. Palace guards rush in, and Belle notes. I see the palace guards are finally coming to your rescue. The guards approach, and Bell adds, I also have a request. Princess urges, Quick! You must morph into another form. Bell, bewildered, responds, What? Wait! Princess insists, Hurry! The palace guards slam the door, announcing, Your Majesty, we have come to you save you! They barge into the room. Princess, with a sense of unease, experiences a chill. One palace guard, realizing the situation, thinks, Is something the matter? She's still alive? We discovered traces of an intruder. 
another palace guard expresses relief. I'm relieved to see that you are safe. The princess, with a hint of sarcasm, remarks, I'm all right, even though you have all failed to protect me. The palace guard apologetic says, Uh, please forgive us. Suddenly, there's a rattle, and the guard notices. A trespasser! Gripping their weapon, they gasp. Princess tries to intervene. W wait, that's... And then there are the unmistakable steps of a cat. The guards, now realizing the situation, comment. Oh, what's a cat doing here? A subtle, meow, resonates in the room, adding an unexpected element to the unfolding scene. The scene unfolds, revealing the layers and depth of the story, introducing new characters and leaving an air of suspense. Kesman pleads for his life. Ah, Roxanne. Please, spare me my life. I beg you. The captain, holding him with a sharp knife at his neck, responds. The request made by Kessman is not a substantial one by any means. In addition, I have no desire whatsoever to kill your betrothed. Kessman continues to plead desperately. I beseech you to reconsider the terms of our peace agreement. This is a meaningless war, and we want to cease. Roxanne, without a word, releases an arrow from her bow. Kessman panics. W. Wait. W. H. What are you doing? Suddenly... Roxanne takes the arrow from her bow and stabs Kessman with it. A shocking act that leaves everyone stunned. Kessman, bewildered, questions, What is the meaning of this? Do you intend to kill your own intended? Put that down. Do you want to kill me? Roxanne, please. Have you forgotten that I'm your intended? Roxanne silences him with a fatal blow, killing him with her own hands. As Kessman slumps down, Roxanne, with a chilling determination, declares, Kill them all. The night was filled with the subtle chirping of crickets as the Grand Duke Asselier and his daughter, Roxanne, discussed their recent triumphs and setbacks in the dimly lit room. Duke Asselier, holding a glass, expressed his amusement. How foolish of them. Did they really think we would accept a peace agreement? Roxanne, confident and composed, replied, those dimwits from Kessman didn't know what hit them, father. Concerned, Duke Asselier inquired about Roxanne's well-being. Were you hurt? Roxanne assured him. Of course not. But please pick someone better as my intended next time, father. She sighed, clearly unimpressed with her previous betrothed. Duke Asselier chuckled. I will keep that in mind. But right now, we have a more important objective to discuss. Roxanne, curious, asked about the assassination of Emperor Luciano. Duke Asselier shared the unfortunate news. Actually, that is precisely what I'd like to speak with you about. There was a setback. Luciano died as we had planned, but that imbecile Arian died as well. Roxanne, infuriated, slammed her drink, demanding answers. How could you be so careless? You should have prevented him from dying. Was it that hard to keep the dullest member of the imperial family alive? Duke Asselier reassured her. Worry not, my daughter. Our plan isn't over yet. This merely means we'll have a different nitwit sitting on the throne. Roxanne, displeased, questioned her father's strategy. So the crown goes to the king of Duran? Duke Asselier confirmed. Yes. For the imperial princess Arnoa gave up all of her rights two years ago. She will become nothing more than his wife and empress. There is nothing to be concerned about. Unlike you, she is a weak, ordinary girl. Roxanne, deep in thought, walked toward a mirror, whispering to herself, Imperial Princess Arnoa. What was she like? Was she really just a weak, ordinary girl like my father says? No. She was more like... Interrupting her thoughts, Duke Asselier tapped her shoulder, reminding her of their lineage. Do not forget. You're my daughter, my flesh and blood. You're the most capable person in the empire and the future empress. I will make sure you sit on the throne. Roxanne, looking in the mirror, continued to ponder. The master of the enchanted tower should deliver the news to the king of Duran in a few days. Duke Asselier agreed. Yes. Maybe he has already been notified. With a determined expression, Roxanne concluded. 
He does not have the slightest idea how heavy the emperor's crown is. I shall let that half-wit from Duran know his place. I will make him understand the difference between a king and an emperor, and who truly wields power within the empire. The stage was set for a power play, and Roxanne was prepared to assert her dominance. Amidst the tranquility of the palace garden, the ladies-in-waiting gathered for a tea party, sharing gossip about the recent events. The first lady-in-waiting, curious, remarked, Is that true, Dana? I can't believe Her Majesty was so infatuated with Rictavian. She even gave him the very ring symbolic of the royal family of Duran. That's hard to believe. She didn't strike me as the type to do such a thing. The second lady-in-waiting, excited, affirmed, I am telling the truth. I didn't know she was even capable of smiling. She was this close to hugging him. I am certain Rictavian won her heart. Larissa, with a hint of disdain, commented, What an embarrassing scandal. It seems that Her Majesty still doesn't know how to conduct herself in Duran. As ladies-in-waiting, we must teach Her Majesty how to dash. Interrupted by an unexpected entrance, Larissa burst. Who dares to enter my greenhouse unannounced? To everyone's surprise, it was Princess Arnoa, who calmly responded. I see you're enjoying tea time in my absence. The ladies-in-waiting, flustered, fumbled and bowed in respect. Larissa scolded. Oh, your majesty. It's considered rude to barge in unannounced, and on your own, no less. Princess Arnoa explained. I was invited, and the door was closed. What other choice did I have? Unconvinced, Larissa retorted. Well, you could have had a servant open the door for you. After all, we wouldn't want mother to get upset again. Princess Arnoa defended herself. I intended to, but all my servants were here having a tea party. As the ladies-in-waiting stared in disbelief, Princess Arnoa thought about the repetitive schemes of Count Estiae and Larissa, noting, The way she uses the same tricks repeatedly is just like her father. A little information on how Larissa and her father are like each other. Count Estiae, Larissa's father, tirelessly produced the same play over and over again and attempted the same assassinations repeatedly without ever growing weary. Larissa held tea parties with similar schemes each time as well. She would invite Arnoa as if she were concerned about Arnoa feeling lonely. Then she'd insult Arnoa for hours, put strange things in her food, and laugh at her after gifting her gaudy outfits. Larissa, trying to act on her scheme, inquired, Your Majesty, where is the dress I gifted you? I chose it with great care. Was it not to your liking? Princess Arnoa bluntly responded, No, it was an eyesore. Larissa, offended, asked, How could you say such harsh words? Are you implying that you have a problem with my taste? Princess Arnoa, unimpressed, critiqued. I'm plying? No, I'm telling you you have terrible taste. Take a look at your hideous dress, for instance. Larissa, visibly upset, exclaimed, Rubbish? Princess Arnoa continued her scrutiny, inspecting a cup of tea. Let's see what rubbish you have served today. Larissa, increasingly agitated, tried to defend the tea, but Princess Arnoa's observations revealed an attempt to alter the flavor. Ignoring Larissa's explanations, Princess Arnoa took a sip and remarked, It's spicy. It changed color. She must have coated the cup with something. Larissa, embarrassed, attempted to save face. I'm afraid you're right. Your lack of taste for finer things worries me, your majesty. You must know how to enjoy the finer things if you want to win the heart of his majesty. Unfazed, Princess Arnoa seized Larissa by the neck, stating, I'm touched that my precious lady-in-waiting is looking out for me. What kind of queen would I be if I didn't reward such behavior? With an air of authority, she commanded. Drink. This is a reward for my chief lady-in-waiting. The ladies-in-waiting watched in astonishment as the dynamics in the palace took an unexpected turn. Amidst the tension in the greenhouse, Princess Arnoa poured the spicy tea into Larissa's mouth, who immediately reacted, coughing and pleading for water. Larissa's distress escalated, exclaiming, It's burning my tongue! Water! Ignoring Larissa's pleas, Princess Arnoa nonchalantly poured more tea into a cup, smirking. 
Larissa snatched the cup, desperately gulped the tea, and dissatisfied yelled, I need water. Give me that. Arg. This is the same tea. In frustration, she threw the cup, shattering it into pieces. Just as the commotion reached its peak, Countess Estiae, Larissa's mother, entered the scene, alarmed. Larissa, still recovering, cried out, Mother! Countess Estiae, concerned for her daughter, replied, Larissa, my dear, and she questioned the source of the disturbance. Princess Arnoa, maintaining her calm demeanor, thought, I was wondering when Countess Estiae would arrive. Larissa, sobbing with pain, screamed and mother, her mother hugs her and inquired, Who did this to you? Larissa, now in her mother's embrace, accused. Her Majesty did this. Countess Estiae, infuriated, demanded an explanation. What is the meaning of this? Princess Arnoa, with a calculating smile, responded. Is it not obvious? I'm glad she's here. She served me some wonderful tea, so I rewarded her accordingly. She slid the cup toward Countess Estiae, implying that Larissa would be instrumental in making her point. Countess Estiae, unimpressed, scolded Princess Arnoa. Forcing her to drink against her will hardly seems like a reward. It's downright barbaric. I expected more from a member of the imperial family. Her anger evident, she continued. You must be punished for your actions. Show me the back of your hand. Princess Anoa, sighing, extended her hand to Countess Estiae, acknowledging the repetitive patterns within Larissa's family. The tension in the greenhouse remained palpable as the three women navigated the aftermath of the peculiar tea incident. Princess Arnoa, holding her hand steady for punishment, thinks, This family sure loves to repeat themselves. Countess Estiae, determined, lifted her swinger, ready to strike. With a swift movement, Princess Arnoa flipped the swinger from Countess Estia's hand and retaliated by slapping it onto Countess Estia's hands. Countess Estiae winced, experiencing the sting, and Princess Arnoa casually asked, My, my, are you all right? Perhaps you could try a gentler swing next time. Ha! <laughs> Larissa's mother, furious, exclaimed, You can't pull your hand back when you're getting punished. You've really learned nothing in the past two years, have you? Princess Arnoa admitted, You're right. Confused, Larissa's mother sought clarification. P pardon me? Princess Arnoa responded. Like you said, I have learned absolutely nothing from you. Oh, but I do remember one thing. You told me that the queen is in charge of the royal staff and that I can hire or let go of anyone I want. Larissa's mother, realizing the implications, twitched uncomfortably. Princess Arnoa continued. There's no need for you to inform his majesty. You are relieved of your duties, countess. Protesting, Larissa's mother questioned. On what grounds? Princess Arnoa declared. Your incompetence is reason enough. Considering the amount of gold you're paid, you should have done a better job of teaching me. Defending herself, Larissa's mother argued. It's your fault you didn't learn a thing from me. Unyielding, Princess Arnoa stated. You have failed me. Your indifference made me the barbaric person I am today. Is it not a teacher's job to lead their student on the right path? Before leaving, Princess Arnoa poured a cup full of tea onto Larissa's head, thanking her for the tea party. Larissa, shocked and in need of water, cried out to her mother. Observing the chaos, the ladies-in-waiting murmured as they saw that the princess is leaving. My poor darling! She seems like a different person. Maybe she has gone mad. Princess Arnoa, unfazed, picked a flower from the garden, deeply inhaling its fragrance, seemingly lost in the moment. Meanwhile, in the palace garden, Princess Arnoa found solace among the flowers, deeply immersed in their fragrances. Unbeknownst to her, the sorcerer Bell and his companion Luca observed the unfolding drama, using their powers of invisibility. Bell couldn't contain his amusement, bursting into laughter. Bwahaha! Is it not hilarious, Luca? Luca, seated on a branch, urged Bell to show some self-control. Master Belcherius, is it really that funny? We're in the middle of the palace. Bell dismissed the concern. It's okay. We're invisible. 
Luca, employing his stealth magic, grumbled about the limits of his powers. Why make me cast it? It's not completely soundproof. Do you want me to stop training you? Bell teased. No, master. What could be so funny about a tea party? Luca replied, slightly confused. You missed all the fun parts because you didn't let me watch it with you. He added. Bell, still amused, encouraged Luca to focus on his training. She's a delight to watch. Luca, intrigued, questioned how Princess Arnoa had concealed her true nature for so long. Is she not hiding it anymore? Bell confirmed. No, she's being herself. Considering the consequences for non-sorcerers, Luca remarked. Honesty rarely pays off for them. It usually gets them killed. Bell chuckled. Only those who are thoughtlessly transparent meet a dreadful end. But her intentions are clear. Concerned, Luca questioned. But isn't it bad for you if she's the meticulous type? Bell, remembering something, fell silent. Luca reminded him of the wager with Princess Arnoa for her soul stone. Luca and Bell sat on the tree, Bell engrossed in his locket. Luca remarked, I thought the two of you had a wager. You should keep her from getting divorced if you want her soul stone. Bell, perturbed, retorted, Luca, flicking his finger at him and saying, When did you become so talkative? It's unattractive. Luca, nursing a slight pain, replied, Oh, why did you do that? And, losing balance, fell from the tree, exclaiming, You scoundrel! While Bell remained serious, he added, Anyway, I'll keep watching her and the future she paves for herself. Under the starry night, Larissa lay on her bed, crying. Binas approached, consoling her. Stop crying, Larissa! She screamed in frustration. Does it not make you angry, your majesty? The queen made a fool out of me! Binas, equally furious, exclaimed. Of course, I'm furious. She sniffled, questioning. Then why are you still keeping her in the palace? Is your love for me fading? Binas reassured. Of course not. Hugging her, he explained. I told you. You're my first and last love. But it's difficult to divorce a member of the imperial family. Benching his wrist, he added. Such hardship. Fate has never been kind to us, Larissa mused. God must be jealous of our love. Binas, frustrated, asserted, We must stay strong. Tearfully, Larissa asked, So are you going to let this go unpunished? Binas, irritated, replied, I will do no such thing. Wiping her tears, he declared, I will make her pay for making you cry. She will learn her lesson at the upcoming Festival of Souls and realize that to wrong you is to wrong me. Smirking, he added, get ready for the spectacle of the century. The next day in the palace, some lady guests in royal attire whispered, Look at the queen's dress. Observing Arnoa in a red royal dress adorned with red roses in her hair, they commented, It looks like it was in fashion a century ago. I heard it was bestowed by His Majesty himself, not Larissa. His Majesty must be quite angry. So you've heard about the tea party incident. When Anoa caught wind of the gossip, she calmly thought, Gossip all you want. Another lady chimed in. The first song has come to an end. Larissa and Binas gracefully danced in front of all the guests. As their dance concluded, the crowd erupted in applause, proclaiming, a round of applause for the most beautiful couple. Binas turned to Larissa, expressing, You and I are a match made in heaven. We even dance well together. Larissa replied, It's because you taught me so well. Meanwhile, Arnoa stepped forward, bowing, and addressed Binas. Your majesty. Binas smirked, saying, The dress suits you. It truly captures the solemnity of a queen. Playfully, he teased, what a thick and heavy fabric. It's as if my great aunt has come back to life. He laughed and added, Those fake purple pearls are a good look on you, your majesty. Arnoa, holding her necklace, pondered, I couldn't care less for their meager insults. I wonder if you're watching me right now, Belle. Two days before the festival, Arnoa stood in a red royal dress when a cat with black patches approached. 
Turning, she looked at the cat and said, Bell? It was indeed Bell. Holding his head, he admonished, I told you never to remove the necklace. I need you to wear it at all times if I am to protect you until the end of our wager. Arnoa, removing the necklace, asked, Did you come all the way here just to tell me that? She wore it again, stating, I took it off so I could change in front of a mirror. Bell, critical, asked, A mirror? Did you even look in the mirror? Because that dress is ghastly. Arnoa, a bit sad, twisted her arms, fluttered her hair, and said, It's my outfit for the Festival of Souls. Binas gave it to me, saying that he wants me to dress the way his great-aunt, who died one hundred years ago, did. Bell noticed a blue gown on a chair and inquired, Must you wear that abomination? Have you no other gowns? While looking in the mirror, Arnoa replied, I appreciate your concern, but it's a fitting dress for the Mad Queen. And I wish to put people off. Bell remarked, You keep saying you're mad, but you're not. Arnoa looked at him and asked, Pardon me? Bell stepped forward, saying, Is it so crazy to say that an actor beloved by the whole nation is handsome? He reminded her of a theater situation. When the king parades his mistress around the court, is it so crazy to punish a lady in waiting for insulting her queen? I don't think it insane at all to discharge that sadistic teacher of yours. Benching her wrist, she added, Common sense has no place in. You should be enraged. Bell replied, It's only natural to have done what you did. There's no need to call yourself mad. Arnoa held her necklace, pondering. I thought sorcerers were heartless. Turning away from him, she said, I see your point. I will no longer call myself mad, for I am not. Bell glanced at her and asked, The festival is tonight, is it not? Does one have to be a noble to be invited? Arnoa replied, Yes. One must hold a title or be related to someone who does. An invitation lay on the table beside a rose. Bell noted, If that's the case, that invitation is of no use to me. I'll have that instead. Arnoa turned and exclaimed, You want me to give you this rose? If you wish to have one, there are plenty of them in the garden. Bell twisted his arms and replied, There are, but I want the one you've picked. She retorted, You're rather juvenile. Extended her hand and gave him the withered rose, saying, This one is withered. To me, it is more beautiful than any other flower. Bell held the rose. When Arnoa gave Bell a red rose, he held it and remarked, It is more beautiful than any other flower. Expressing concern, he added, I'm afraid you're a tad bit late. Upon Arnoa's arrival at the party, Larissa informed her, I have already picked my partner. With a smirk from Binus, Arnoa confidently replied, I do not need a partner. Binus gestured and assured, But worry not, I have found you another. A person with blonde curly hair arrived, wearing a green dress. Binus suggested, Why don't you greet him first? You'll be dancing with him all night, after all. The man was Binus's distant relative, Marquis Robert Dine. Arnoa recognized him, saying, Marquis Dine. Whispers circulated among the guests. Isn't he that awful scoundrel who uses dirty tricks to get any woman he sets his sights on into his bed? Dine bowed in front of Arnoa, stating, It's an honor to be your partner, your majesty. At least someone is happy about this arrangement. Could it be that your majesty has two left feet? Perhaps that is why the king prefers the tender company of Larissa. Larissa and Binus smirked, enjoying Arnoa's discomfort. Dine knelt and said, Allow me to soften up your stiff body. Pointing his finger and boldly claiming, even the most frigid shrew couldn't turn down a real man like me. He grabbed Arnoa from her waist, coming closer, and slid his hand on her face, saying, Let us dance. Arnoa swiftly placed her hand at his neck, surprising him. He exclaimed, Ha! Huh! In that moment, she yanked him, causing him to scream in pain. Arnoa, screaming, declared, It's quite simple to overpower someone with their guard down. You don't have to be a real man to do that. Dine started apologizing, saying, My apologies. 
I'm the one who is playing the palace troublemaker these days, not you. Arnoa put her foot on Dain's shoe and stomped, causing him to scream in pain. Witnessing this, Bainas ordered Arnoa. What do you think you're doing to my guest? Arnoa, with a smile, replied. The Marquis acted impertinently first. Bainas defended Dain, saying. He was merely jesting. Why must you overreact like that? You really have lost your mind. Arnoa twisted her arms and provocatively added, Why don't you punish me then? Bainas gritted his teeth, stating, I'm not to be trifled with. You think you can belittle me just because you're from the imperial family? Let's see how long you can keep up that attitude. Meanwhile, two girls upstairs plotted to pour water on Arnoa. Bainas noticed and, looking at them, one girl said to another, Quickly, pour it on her before she walks away. Arnoa, anticipating the prank, thought, I can't believe he planned such a childish prank. She clenched her wrist as the girls started pouring water on her, thinking, Fine, I'll use this to my advantage. It will be easier to act crazy when I'm wet. Just as the water was about to drench her, Bell appeared and shielded her, using his gown to surround her. Arnoa was shocked to see Bell wearing a black eye mask. Bell? Binas screamed. Who are you? How dare you lay a hand on the queen? Bell, smiling, replied. What do you mean? I merely saved my partner from a rather difficult situation. As this is a joyous occasion, please demonstrate your great generosity and grace, your majesty. Binas, trembling with rage, heard this. Bell held on Noah's hand, saying, My queen, bowed, and kissed her hand apologizing for being late. Arnoa asked in surprise, How did you? Belle presented her with a red rose, saying, This is for you. As she held the rose, its color started changing. She exclaimed, The color of the rose is... After holding the rose, its color became blue, and her gown transformed into a golden color. To see this, people started whispering, The queen's gown changed. What is happening? It was red velvet until seconds ago. She looks so much better now. Arnoa whispered to Belle. Are you crazy? He asked her. Do you not like it? She replied. I'm not talking about the gown. You can't use magic out in the open. Belle pointed at the rose and said. I didn't. That's just an artifact. Arnoa was shocked, stating. Artifact, magic, it all looks the same to people. We should leave immediately. Bell grabbed her waist, bringing her closer, and added, I told you that I would escort you. She replied, Yes, you did, but it's time to run. In that starry night, with the moon shining brighter, Arnoa and Bell left the castle. Arnoa asked him, Why did you help me? He replied, Because you asked for protection. She turned and looked at him, saying, I don't need you to protect me from getting splashed with dirty water. It would have made my mad queen act more persuasive. She asked him, Bell, did you help me to sabotage my plan to obtain a divorce? Bell came closer to her and said, If that's how it seemed, you're free to believe so. Arnoa held her head and said, I suppose it fits your character. Bell looked at her with a smile. She grabbed her necklace and expressed, Nonetheless, you're the only one who protects me around here. Thank you. The next day, the castle looked beautiful in the sunshine. Binas, in a fit of rage, screamed. She's gone mad. Utterly mad, I tell you. Binas crumpled the paper in his hand with anger, turning to Dine standing beside him. You there? Tell me your thoughts. What did you think of the queen yesterday? Dine, while smiling, replied. Uh... She was beautiful, your majesty. Binas, in a fit of rage, shouted at him. You buffoon! I couldn't care less about how she looked. He clarified. I'm talking about her behavior. How could she let herself be escorted by another man right in front of me? Clutching the paper again, he screamed. But Marquis Dine did so by your order, not him. Binas emphasized. I meant the man in the mask. Dine considered for a moment and remarked. Oh, that handsome man. Binas retorted. He's no doubt ugly under his mask. 
While sitting, Bainas twisted his arms and questioned. Did you find out which estate he is from? Dain calmly replied. Yes, your majesty. He is Count Lurk of Lurk Estate. Bainas insisted. That can't be right. I know Count Lurk. I used to attend lessons with him in the palace when I was young. Dine conveyed his concern, saying, I'm afraid Count Lurk's estate and title were purchased by someone yesterday. Bainas scolded him. Who could possibly buy the fourth largest estate in Duran? Clenching his hand in rage, he added, I'm sure the queen is behind all this. It's all her doing. I'm certain of it. Politely, Dine inquired, Why would she do that? Bainas sighed and replied, Jealousy. Lost in thought, he continued, She is trying to get me to become jealous. She must be looking for other ways to get to me now that she can't harass Larissa anymore. Bainas recalled, Do you remember Rick Tavian? It is obvious she was using him to make me jealous. It all makes sense now. Pathetic woman. Smiling, Dine remarked, I think she just likes good-looking men. Meanwhile, a servant burst into the room, opening the door, and screamed, Your Majesty! A carrier pigeon just arrived from Kessman. The servant informed Bainas, Do you remember deploying our soldiers to aid in the war between the Imperial Army and Kessman? Bainas replied, Of course. It was the Emperor's order. The servant conveyed the news from the letter. The letter says Grand Duke Asselier is forming a special force made of our Duranian soldiers. The special force of Grand Duke Asselier, established by the Grand Duke himself. Bainas was shocked to hear this revelation. He added, Acting as commander-in-chief, the Grand Duke uses them to eliminate anyone who gets in his way. And when their service is no longer needed, they're sent to the front lines to die. Bainas asked, Did the Emperor order this himself? The servant replied, I cannot say for sure. Bainas inquired again, Could this be about the Queen? The servant responded, It is a possibility. Why else would the Grand Duke threaten Duran like this? Even though they're not on good terms, she is the sister of the Emperor. It might bother His Imperial Majesty that she is still not blessed with the love of Your Majesty after two years of marriage. Bainas placed his hand on his mouth and said, Damn, that leaves only one option. He put his hand on his head, adding, I suppose I'll have to save the day. Tell the ladies in waiting to get her ready. On the other hand, Arnoa sat in front of a mirror, with a hairdresser attending to her. Many items were on the dressing table. As she combed her hair, she asked, What exactly are you doing? The hairdresser responded, Isn't it fragrant? Rose perfumed oil does wonders for your hair. Lady Larissa puts this on every day. Arnoa replied, That is not what I asked. The hairdresser explained, I told you, it's the king's order, and extended her hand to pick up a spray, saying, Let me spray you with this perfume Lady Larissa uses. It's his majesty's favorite. Irritated, Arnoa warned, If you get a single drop of that on me, I will have your hand cut off. The hairdresser picked out all the sprays, bowed, and said, I'll take my leave now, your majesty. Arnoa sighed and thought, Isn't it enough that he's making me put on all this makeup? Why must he make me go along with his preferences? What game is he playing at? Someone knocked at the door, saying, My queen. It was Binas, wearing a robe, holding a red rose, and keeping it in his mouth. He said, The preparations took quite some time, I see. Arnoa, shocked to see him, asked, what are you doing in my chambers? And why are you not dressed? She shielded her eyes with her hand and added, It's repulsive. I mean, it is inappropriate. She thought, So this was what he was up to. Binas stepped in, holding a rose in his mouth, and added, Tonight I shall give you what you've been longing for. Arno asked, What are you talking about? He came closer through the rose and said, you didn't have to harass Larissa and put on a display with another man at the ball to ask for my love. Arnoa was utterly shocked. Wait, are you offering? Binas blinked his eye and said, You may have my body. Arnoa denied him. Um, I do not want it. Binas added, 
Let's make an error while we're at it. She got shocked. What? Meanwhile, a cat stepped in. Binas leaned his hand on his chest and said, You need not play coy anymore. You have my permission to indulge in your lust for me. Arnoa said, Get away from me. The cat came closer to Binas and attacked him by scratching his chest. Binas screamed in pain. Ugh! Witnessing this, Arnoa thought, What is this cat doing here? Binas scolded the cat. How dare you scratch me? He fell down and started trembling. After that, the cat jumped on Arnoa. She said, Stop, Snowy. Come here, listen carefully, your majesty. Binas was shocked to see this. Arnoa said while smiling, If you ever try something like this again, you might end up like Marquis Dine. Binas asked, Are you saying you will break my foot? She replied, Perhaps your foot will be broken, or perhaps your tool for siring in air. Try me if you're curious. Binas left in rage, slamming the door loudly, saying, You're a mad woman! The cat said meow meow. Arnoa touched it politely and said, Oh, sorry, turn back to human form. No one will come here for a while. It's fine. She hugged the cat. At that moment, the cat turned into Bell. Arnoa, still hugging him, said, Oops, sorry about that. Bell smiled and added, This is why I told you to let me go first. Bell arrived to safeguard Arnoa from Binas, transitioning from a cat to a man. As a man, Arnoa embraced him, expressing her frustration. This is why I asked you to let me go first. Did you not hear me a moment ago? Arnoa wondered if Bell had been attempting to communicate during his meowing. Moving away, she inquired. Anyway, why did you do that? Bell responded. What do you mean? Arnoa pointed out. You attacked Binus. I thought, as the Empire's messenger, you aren't allowed to harm the next emperor. Bell nonchalant whistled and remarked. It's okay to scratch him with claws. Tis but a flesh wound. He clarified. As long as I don't harm him with magic? Arnoa questioned. But why? She reminded him. You're supposed to keep me from getting a divorce. Inquiring about her soul stone, she asked. Don't you want it? Bell shrugged, saying. Didn't you hear that the master of the enchanted tower is capricious? I'm famous for doing whatever I want, as fickle as the wind. Approaching her, he added. Just now I felt like giving the king a good scratch, so I did. He confessed. If there weren't a magic contract between sorcerers and the imperial family, I would have killed him right then and there. The next day in the jungle, Binas and his companions targeted a raccoon. Despite Binas shooting an arrow, the nimble raccoon eluded the attack. Rushing after it, he exclaimed, That little vermin! His companions praised his shot acknowledging the difficulty of hitting such a nimble creature. Suggesting a change of prey, one added, Raccoons are trickier to hunt than bears or boars. Maybe it's time to find another game. Seeing Binas's trembling hand, another questioned, Was it another shoot and miss, your majesty? Observing his lack of arrows, they remarked, You're already out of arrows. Offering his catch, one companion suggested, would you like me to give you the raccoon I caught? Enraged, Binas grabbed his collar and shouted, Silence! Shut your mouth! Other companion restrained Binas, urging mercy. Have mercy, your majesty, he explained to Binas. He's new and has a lot to learn about manners. Binas gritted his teeth, frustrated by the cat, the raccoon, and now the young companion mocking him. Attempting to comfort Larissa, who burst into tears, he recalled a moment when she was crying on a bed, holding a pillow, accusing him of betrayal. Binas tried to explain. It's not like that, reminding her. After hearing that, I went to Arnoa's chambers. Furious at Arnoa, he thought about her. Arnoa. When the cat attacked him and she threatened him, he pondered. Did she mean it? Deciding. I wanted to have an heir with imperial lineage. He... Holding a bow and arrow, wondered. Speaking of heirs, why is Larissa not getting pregnant? Shuddering at the thought, he questioned. Am I at fault? Adding, that can't be. I am the great king of Duran. 
In that moment, a raccoon attacked him, snatching a bottle and smiling. Binas, furious, shouted, You damned raccoon! His companions tried to calm him, saying, Your Majesty. Meanwhile, Arnoa, in a hunting outfit, and Larissa arrived. Arnoa laughed at Binas, while Larissa, in a pink royal dress, mentioned accompanying Binas often. Arnoa, unimpressed, noted, Here we go again, revealing her experience in hunts at the Imperial Palace and Duke Rickles Manor. Larissa, attempting to impress, asked about Arnoa's archery skills. Arnoa, seeing through the lie, thought, Foolish girl. Responding to Larissa, she suggested finding another teacher. Larissa shouted, defending Binas, and Arnoa calmly replied, Duran is doomed if its finest warrior is unable to take down a mere raccoon. Larissa challenged Arnoa to an archery competition, bragging about her past victory. Arnoa proposed a hunting competition, prompting Larissa to consider the lack of targets. Arnoa countered Larissa's claims of hunting success, causing Larissa to get furious and scream. W.H. What of it? That's still more than you. Larissa took a fighting stance and challenged Arnoa. If your majesty is so confident, hunt something bigger than a rabbit. She proposed a condition. I will approve of your majesty's archery skills if you manage to hit an animal with an arrow at least once. Arnoa responded, Your approval means nothing to me unless you're going to apologize for your rude behavior the last time. Trembling, Larissa asked, Did your majesty say apologize? Larissa thought, Why would I apologize to a powerless queen? There's no way she can shoot better than me. She's been stuck in the palace for the last two years. Larissa agreed. Fine, and added, spreading her hand. But if I win, you do the same, your majesty. I want you to apologize for what you did to me and my mother. Taunting Larissa, Arnoa said. An animal bigger than a rabbit once, huh? Don't you think it's a dumb wager? Shocked, Larissa asked. Pardon me? Arnoa explained. Bigger animals are harder to kill with just one shot, but landing an arrow on them should be much easier compared to smaller critters. Larissa screamed. Just go to the forest and start shooting, your majesty. A servant suggested postponing the competition, but Larissa dismissed it, taunting. Her majesty is brave enough to go into the forest by herself. Or is it too frightening, your majesty? Give up if you would like. It wouldn't be the first time you lost to me. Arnoa grabbed an arrow, stating, I don't need to go into the forest. Astonished, Larissa asked, Excuse me? As Arnoa pulled the arrow, she declared, There's no need to waste everyone's time when there is an animal bigger than a rabbit right in front of me. Larissa screamed, Hold on, what are you doing? Arnoa aimed at her and asked, What does it look like? She replied herself, I'm hunting. In the jungle, everyone went hunting. Larissa taunted Arnoa, who decided to teach her a lesson. Arnoa, placing an arrow in her bow, declared, What does it look like? I'm hunting. Furious, Larissa screamed. Why you wouldn't? His majesty will punish you if anything happens to me. Arnoa asked. Really? Larissa smirked, thinking. Even she wouldn't outright defy the king. Arnoa smiled and said, I'm curious how he will punish me. Staggering, Larissa fell down, saying, W wait, your majesty. Arnoa replied, I'm no knight. I have no means to protect myself. I cannot hunt alone in the forest. Smiling, she added, But lucky for me, there's a beast right in front of me. She tightly held Larissa's mouth, who thought, She is mad. She will hurt me just like she did at the tea party. A servant tried to intervene, saying, Please, your majesty. Another said, This jest has gone too far. Arnoa screamed, Silence! Aiming an arrow, she said, I'm releasing the string. Larissa, scared, covered her ears, and Arnoa threw the arrow beside her. Larissa sighed in relief. Seeing the arrow, she asked, What was that? Arnoa attacked a boar, shocking everyone. A servant exclaimed, W.H., what in the world? Larissa, still scared, sat on her knees. 
Arnoa put her bow back and asked. Boars are bigger than rabbits, yes? Larissa, trembling, screamed. Do you have any idea what you've just done? Unbelievable. Arnoa smiled. I believe I've just won. Holding Larissa's mouth, she added. Which means you owe me an apology. Larissa started weeping and apologized. Arnoa smiled. Lady Larissa! She lost consciousness. Later, they returned to the castle. Larissa, sitting on her bed, Binas arrived, shouting, Larissa, who did this to you? A servant sat nearby. Seeing Binas, Larissa became emotional, hugged him, and said, Your Majesty. Binas asked, The Queen, what did she do? Larissa was wailing and replied, She threatened to shoot me with an arrow. Binas, disbelieving, asked again, What? Is that true? Larissa added, And on top of that, she laughed at me after I fell. Furious, Binas thought, That fall woman! She didn't cause any trouble the last two years. What has gotten into her recently? He hugged Larissa and looked at the doctor. The doctor hesitated, and when pressed by Binas said, Not exactly, your majesty. The doctor asked Larissa about her last menstrual cycle, revealing that she was about two weeks late. Larissa admitted feeling nausea and dizziness. The doctor announced, Congratulations, your majesty. Lady Larissa is pregnant. Shocked, Binas asked. What? Overjoyed, they looked happy, and Binas asked the doctor. Is that true? Is she really carrying my child? Larissa hugged him tightly, and the doctor confirmed. Yes, absolute stability must be secured. Larissa exclaimed, Did you hear that, your majesty? I'm pregnant with a child of Duranian blood. Binas smiled, thinking, that means there is nothing wrong with my body. Larissa, crying, said, I'm so very happy. Binas asked, What's wrong? It's terrifying to think. She added, That I nearly lost our child because of the queen. She almost killed my baby. Furious, Binas thought, How dare she insult my appearance, threaten to hurt my family jewels? Adding, And try to harm this hard-earned child of mine? Squeezing Larissa's shoulder, he thought. She crossed the line. I must have her punished. He strode into the library, shouting, Arnoa! Arnoa, grabbing a book, heard Binas shouting, I'm aware of all your malicious acts. You have taken advantage of my generosity for long enough. Ordering servants, he declared, Lock her up in a room immediately and do not let her out. Servants grabbed her, affirming, Yes, your majesty. Binas added, No one is to see her until I give my permission. Do not bring her a single meal or a sip of water. He thought, When she is on the verge of dying of hunger, she will have to beg me for mercy. The servants threw her into the room and locked the door, informing Binas, The door is locked, your majesty. Good. Binas ordered a lady servant, saying, Keep an eye on her and report anything she says. The servant replied, Yes, your majesty. Binas thought, I can already see her begging me to spare her after she's reduced to skin and bones. After that, Arnoa whispered silently, He's gone. She tried to pull and open the door, realizing, The door is locked. He must be planning to starve me. She raised her hand and thought, Well, I'm not going to let him get his way so easily. Arnoa wrote something on a piece of paper, saying, first things first, and grabbed her necklace in hand. Arnoa carefully divided the bread into two portions before dipping a piece into a hot slurry and taking a bite. Flicking her finger, she remarked, All I asked for was just a little piece of bread. The dining table sparkled with a variety of delicious foods in front of her. While indulging, she commented, You didn't have to prepare a whole feast. Bell, cutting a piece of steak with his fork, brought it close to Arnoa's mouth, saying, I can't have you starved to death. As she held a necklace, her thoughts revealed, I mean, I did blackmail him, saying my soul stone would shrivel if I starve. Belle added, I even brought desserts. But Arnoa reclaimed the fork, stating, I can eat by myself. Pondering, but isn't this a tad bit too much? Beside her, 
Bell playfully twisted his arms, noting, I heard that women like desserts more than main dishes. Arnoa, enjoying her steak, glanced at him and asked, Are you interested in what women like? Bell smiled, responding, I am now. Arnoa humorously added, One might say I'm the pregnant one. Even Larissa wouldn't be eating this much. Bell shrugged, saying, I thought her pregnancy is fake. While holding a knife, Arnoa clarified, It is. It's Dr. Ludes's handiwork. Bell, surprised, replied, Oh, I didn't know she could even do that. Arnoa, smiling, said, She's quite capable. Reflecting, from the disrupted menstrual cycle to the slight nausea and occasional fatigue. Continuing, she admitted, All I wanted was for her to lie that Larissa is pregnant. I didn't know she'd even make Larissa have the symptoms of a pregnancy. Thanks to her, Bainas will now have something that'll justify our divorce. Bell, moving towards the door, inquired, Right, the door of this room will stay locked for some time, yes? Arnoa affirmed. It will. Opening the door, Bell stated. Good. He won't be discovered then. Arnoa was taken aback, questioning. He? Bell clarified. I'm expecting a guest. It doesn't concern you. Arnoa looked at him and asked. How will that guest visit you when the door is locked? He climbs quite well. As someone started stepping inward, Arnoa exclaimed. What do you mean he clim? but was abruptly astonished. Wait, that's a raccoon! The raccoon entered the room, reminding Arnoa of the one from the jungle. When Bainas expressed irritation, she cursed. That damned raccoon! Rising from her chair, she remembered. I remember him, and began patting it kindly, asking. Is he your student? He's the raccoon from the hunting ground. The raccoon, now a Luca, shook hands with Arnoa. Bell intervened, saying, that's enough. Report. Luca transformed back into a raccoon, waving his hand. Hi, your majesty. And excitedly sitting on his knees. Bell, hitting him on the head, demanded, I believe you have news to deliver. Luca, rubbing his head, replied, Hee hee, I did hear a few things from Kessman. Arnoa, shocked, questioned, Kessman? That's the nation. She began thinking, at the northernmost end of the continent where Grand Duke Asselier and his daughter are engaging in war. Bell sat on the bed, squeezing a pillow in his arms. Arnoa, looking at him, asked, Why did you bring me news about Kessman? Bell explained, I thought you wanted to know about it. Rolling his head on the pillow, adding, You said the war must have something to do with the assassination. Arnoa, approaching Luca, thought, I'm surprised he remembered that and asked, Is the war coming to an end? Luca shrugged, replying, Nope, it's still very much ongoing. But it's not because Kessman is putting up a good fight. Arnoa, covering her mouth, speculated, The Grand Duke is dragging out the war, huh? Luca, shocked, asked, How did you know that? Arnoa remarked, It doesn't take a genius to know that the war is necessary to continue the flow of funds from the Empire to the Grand Duke. She added, Things in the Empire are actually even messier than in Duran. While contemplating, Arnoa squinted her eyes and inquired, Is there anything else? Luca pointed at her, revealing, Oh right, I heard that the Grand Duke manormed a special force recently. Astonished, Arnoa questioned, A special force? Why so suddenly? She pondered, The members of special forces are practically sentenced to death. That's where the Grand Duke sends people he doesn't like to punish them. Arnoa remarked. Curious, she inquired. Who are the members of the special force? Luca, unsure, replied. Um, let's see. Sitting on the floor, he continued. They're from all sorts of backgrounds, and they never did anything to anger the Grand Duke, but they all have one thing in common. Arnoa pressed. What's that? Luca explained. All twenty men are from Duran. He must have heard about Arian's death. It's likely that the Grand Duke's plan was to kill Luciano and keep Arian alive. But now that he learned Arian is dead, he added, he must be trying to break the spirit of Duran's king, who is next in line to the throne. 
Shrugging, he mentioned. And that was ten days ago. Concerned, Arnaud asked. Are they already? Luca quickly responded. Oh, yes. He sighed, adding. The special force all died on a dangerous mission a few days ago. The Kesmanians must be furious with the Empire to put their heads on spikes and display them. Kesman did the Grand Duke a favor by delivering a warning to Binus. Fall in line. Bell, puzzled, questioned. Why go through all that trouble? The Grand Duke could have killed the soldiers himself. Arnaud explained. That would have made him responsible for their deaths. This is one of the simplest power play strategies. She added. The problem is Binas might be too stupid to understand even a simple warning like that. Actually, he didn't understand it and tried to bed Arnoa wearing a robe. Arnoa, with a smile, placed her hand on her mouth and muse. Perhaps, this might work in my favor. Bell also smiled as he looked at her. Binas slammed his hand on the table in rage, shouting loudly. What did you just say? A lady servant stood trembling in front of him. Binus scolded her, saying, Ugh, that spiteful woman. How is she still not apologizing? It's been three days already. The lady servant leaned against the door and explained, Her majesty didn't make any sound at all, so I had a maid ask how she was doing. Curious, she asked. Your majesty? A reply came. Totally fine. Binus, frustrated, questioned, What? A male servant standing beside her added, and all her majesty said was I'm fine. She even sounded more vigorous than three days ago. Binas, irritated, put his hand on his head, muttering, Is she a witch or something? He pondered, How can she remain haughty when she was locked away without food and water for three days? She looks like she would faint if she skipped a few meals. Perhaps it's merely an act of bravado. Yes, she must be acting tough to save face. He added, Has that woman no shame? She should have apologized for her actions by now. Contemplating further, he worried. I want to make her starve more, but what if she dies? If the emperor finds out that I starved his sister to death. He shuddered at the thought, took a sigh, and said, Sigh, what to do? Suddenly, someone burst into the room, exclaiming, there's been a disaster, your majesty, Binas demanded. What now? A man standing in front of him reported. A message came from Kesman. Binas, shocked, asked. What's the message? The man replied. The special force that was established all got captured by the enemies and were executed. Binas started sweating, stammering. W.H. what? The messenger bowed his head, adding. Some of their heads were even put on spikes and displayed on the wall. Binas, enraged, slammed his hands on the table, exclaiming, W.H. what? Utterly shocked, he questioned. What did I do to deserve this? In his thoughts, he reflected. Even though Arnoa turned me down that night, I managed to spread a rumor that we shared a bed. He continued, There should be no reason for Emperor Luciano to hate me. The families of the dead knights will want an explanation, and I can't ignore them because they're nobles. I didn't know the emperor cared about his sister this much. Having the esteemed imperial princess as my queen and keeping Larissa as my lover was a feat to boast of. A sweating servant in front of him stammered. Why, your majesty, the lords are waiting in the audience room. Binas flinched. Already? He clenched his teeth and ordered. Free the queen. Reflecting on his situation, he thought. I thought this marriage would benefit me, but it's holding me back instead. Two persons wearing royal dress screamed. This is preposterous, your majesty. Twenty men who were sent from Duran died meaningless deaths. Another added. How could the empire treat us this way? A person standing beside him shouted. Duran has always been a loyal servant to the empire. Someone asked. What's gotten into the emperor? Binas expressed. I, too, am perplexed by the emperor's actions. It turns out becoming a brother-in-law of the emperor was nothing but a shackle. Nibbling his finger, he added. But I'm already married to Arnoa. I cannot take it back now. Count Estiae, Larissa's father, suggested. A divorce should be considered an option. 
Binas asked again. A divorce? Count Estiari replied. Yes, your majesty. The marital union with the queen is no longer beneficial to Duran. Binas added. One can't just divorce an imperial princess. His imperial majesty would. He stood up from his chair and said, I'm sure his imperial majesty could be reasoned with. He explained to Binas. If your majesty and the emperor come to an understanding and if you persuade the emperor that the divorce is justified, it could be done. Adding, and your majesty will no longer have to anger the emperor by punishing her majesty like you're doing now. Others nodded in agreement. Concerned, Binas expressed. But Duran is not able to pay back the dowry the queen brought to our marriage. It was a carriage filled with gold. What do we do about that? Larissa's father confidently replied, I shall summon all the scholars within Durand to scrutinize the laws, your majesty. There must be a way not to give back the dowry. He added, In any case, our prime goal now is to protect your majesty and Larissa's child. A red-headed man suggested, First, let us send a token of fealty to the empire to demonstrate your majesty's loyalty and appease the emperor. Then, we shall seek a way to make the divorce possible. Binas replied, I shall consider your counsel, while smiling and thinking. Yes, there must be a way. There's always a loophole. In a beautiful garden of the castle, Larissa fluttered her pink royal dress. Her mother praised her, saying, That is a beautiful dress, Lady Larissa. Larissa replied, Ha ha, do you think so? She added, I told her to wear something that isn't a gift from the king when she is walking in the gardens. The king loves her. Oh my! But what do you know? All of her dresses are gifts from his majesty. Larissa smiled and replied, Mother, it's nothing to boast about. His majesty only gave me ten dresses. Larissa's friends looked at her and exclaimed, Wow! Oh my, so many! Another friend said, The dresses are nothing compared to this ruby necklace. Larissa touched her ruby necklace, shining and sparkling. Another friend added, That's right, you also got a ruby necklace. Her friend expressed jealousy. I'm so jealous. His majesty is such a romantic. It's so elegant and shiny. Larissa and her mother smiled and laughed. She added, The last time, his majesty even gave you a black diamond. His majesty really knows how to make his lover happy. I want to be as loved as you are one day, Larissa proudly stated. I've been awaiting this rush, she replied to her friends. I am loved by the king himself. Admire me. Envy me. Someone called her, saying, Larissa, she asked. Huh? It was Arnoa standing in front of her. Larissa became furious to see her and said, Your Majesty. In the garden area of Castle Larissa, the royal atmosphere was disrupted when Arnoa entered. Larissa, adorned in her royal dress, acknowledged her presence, respectfully greeting. Your Majesty. Her friends followed suit, bowing before Arnoa and offering their greetings. The castle's servants, one by one, extended their respectful greetings, addressing Arnoa as, Your Majesty. Noticing Larissa's mother standing nearby, Arnoa remarked, I see someone has yet to greet me. This remark angered Larissa's mother. Arnoa continued, Did the time you spent outside the palace make you forget the proper court etiquette? Larissa's mother, visibly upset, responded, Your Majesty. Arnoa inquired about her wrist, recalling a past incident when Larissa's mother had punished her. She mentioned, How is your wrist? You hit yourself quite hard, did you not? Larissa's mother reflected on the moment, thinking, but this time, as Arnoa attempted to lift a paper fan, Larissa's mother resisted, thinking, I will not play along. However, the fan accidentally struck her hand, causing her to scream in pain. Arnoa taunted her, saying, I never thought I would see you scream like a little girl. It must have hurt a lot. Larissa's mother, visibly angered, stammered, Th, thank you for your concern. In fact, I was concerned about your majesty as well. Arnoa inquired. Were you now? 
I heard your majesty was locked away after acting like an untamed horse. She added, Three days without food or water must have taken a toll on your majesty. The other girls were shocked to hear this, exchanging glances. Larissa's mother, with a sly smile, remarked, Although it must have done wonders for your majesty's figure, Lord knows you needed to lose a few pounds. She pondered, How strange. Isn't she a bit too vibrant for someone who starved for three days? Arnoa, seemingly unfazed, smiled politely, stating, The king would never do such a cruel thing to me. I have been doing quite well. Swishing her gray hair back, she added, Especially since Larissa apologized for her rude behavior toward me in the past. Larissa, astonished, shouted, W.H. what? I only apologized because you threatened to shoot me with an arrow. While I was pregnant, might I add? Arnoa twirled her hair and casually asked, Did I? I was only aiming at a boar. Hmm? Are you saying I'm a boar? She provocatively added, You sure squealed like one. Larissa, seething with rage, clenched her teeth as Arnoa stepped forward. Larissa retorted, Until now, I've shown you respect because I pitied your majesty's situation. But do not expect such courtesy any longer. She declared, I tire of seeing you move aside. Arnoa nonchalantly responded, You move aside. Larissa, taken aback, asked, I beg your pardon? Arnoa sighed, saying, I was crossing the bridge first, and you came along later. Therefore, you should move aside. In a fit of rage, Larissa thought, she really doesn't know her place yet, does she? I am the king's first love and his beloved mistress. She smiled, thinking, So she wants to dance, huh? Larissa taunted Arnoa, reminding her of the black diamonds on her crown, claiming, The king said such a precious jewel belongs on my head and gifted me the crown, a matching set with his majesty's. Arnoa calmly acknowledged, I remember. Larissa continued, I'm his majesty's lover, and you are not. There is nothing you can do to change that. With a smile, she asserted. Imperial lineage is nothing compared to the king's love. Arnoa questioned. Are you sure about that? Larissa proudly displayed her ruby necklace, claiming. His majesty even gifted me this ruby necklace today. Arnoa remained unfazed, thinking. I could not care less. Larissa asked. Is it not beautiful? She added. Anyway, I can take anything from your majesty, even though there is little to take from you since you are not blessed with his majesty's love. Arnoa intriguingly responded. Oh? Larissa, showing no signs of shock, inquired. What's that? Hm? Arnoa calmly replied. Is this your first time seeing a mystic eye? Larissa screamed. I've seen one before. Where did you get your hands on such a thing? Arnoa advised. Larissa, there are things in this world that should not be pursued with greed. It's a virtue to know when to step back. Larissa shouted. You must have hidden it in a drawer or somewhere for two years. She eyed Arnoa's golden necklace and declared. I want it. Moving aside, she stated. I'll move aside if you hand it over. Arnoa retorted. You're worse than a boar. You're a bandit. While distancing herself, Arnoa added, I'll end up having it one way or another. So why don't you just give it to me? If you refuse? Larissa snickered, suggesting, I might fall into the pond. Arnoa, unyielding, responded, Why should I care? Larissa emphasized, You do know I'm carrying the king's child, don't you? If something were to happen to me, his majesty would have to punish you. How dare you harm Larissa? Assertively, she questioned. And what would people say? Pushing the woman carrying off her husband's child into the pond. Isn't that what the villainess did in the burning palace? She smirked, adding, Your majesty wouldn't want to get divorced like the villainess too, would you? I'd hate to make you the villainess who tried to kill me out of jealousy. Arnoa, reflecting on Larissa's tactics, thought, Larissa, you're a genius! Extending her hand towards Arnoa, Larissa said, Of course, if you want me to. As Larissa reached for Arnoa's necklace, Arnoa held her hand and remarked, 
I hope you know how to swim. Never mind. I actually don't care. Larissa, startled, found herself placed along the bridge. Panicking, she exclaimed, Huh! H, hold on, your majesty! Arnoa shoved her into the water, and Larissa screamed, Ah! Uh, help! Servants and her mother joined in the distress, shouting, Oh my goodness! Larissa! Lady Larissa! Her mother urgently ordered, Guards! Come help her! Meanwhile, Arnoa stood there, smiling and looking at her handiwork. Larissa sat on the bed, shouting and weeping, her head buried in a pillow as she screamed. Bina stood beside her, attempting to calm her. Calm down, Larissa! She continued to scream. How could I? She pushed me into the pond! Bina sighed and asked. Did she really? With tears in her eyes, Larissa screamed. Are you doubting me? The mother of your majesty's child? Bina is reassured. Of course not. Larissa sniffled heavily and Binas, sitting beside her on his knees, apologized. Sorry, it was just hard to believe. He hugged her, saying, Oh, Larissa, you have been through hell. A servant explained to Binas. Actually, the pond is not nearly deep enough to drown. If she had stayed calm, she wouldn't have drunk so much pond water. Furious, Binas shouted at the servant. Get out. You use this windbag. Trembling in rage, he added, No matter how busy the staff is due to the aftermath of the Kessman incident, sending that imbecile as my errand boy is unacceptable. Turning towards Larissa, he assured, Don't mind him, Larissa. I'm just grateful to the gods that you and our child are unharmed. While crying, Larissa questioned, What if it happens again? The queen tried to kill me many times, and she will try again. Sniffling, she moved closer to him, asking, Your Majesty, why are you not divorcing her? She added, Are her murder attempts not reason enough to get a divorce? Binas replied, There are a thousand reasons to divorce her. Reflecting on the theater scenario, he grimaced. She enjoyed the company of other men right in front of me, and she even called her king hideous. Binas frowned and continued, However, even after consulting with all the legal experts, there was no solution. He remembered Larissa's father saying, Forgive me, your majesty. Binas gritted his teeth, realizing. He was just all talk. I'd have him whipped if he wasn't Larissa's father. I would have to return all of her dowry if I divorce her. Binas clenched his hand with anger, thinking. But I already spent most of it. He added, the gold that filled an entire carriage was used on new palace pillars, the gardens, and Larissa's dresses and jewelry. Reflecting, Binas realized. Come to think of it, the pond Larissa fell into today was also made with that gold. Larissa mumbled. What if she left in some other way? She asked. What other way? Smirking, she suggested. Like dying at the hands of people who have had enough of her malicious acts? On the other hand, Bell sighed, saying, I am sick and tired of Count Estia's lousy assassination attempts, holding the collar of a guy amidst a scene of dead bodies and scattered blood. Flicking his fingers, he remarked, Increasing the number of assassins fivefold won't change a thing if they're all this sloppy. Meanwhile, Arnoa, in her night suit, sat on a bed, contemplating, He would rather send more assassins than divorce me? She sighed and rubbed her head, saying, I should have brought a smaller dowry. It's not like I had a say anyway. Arnoa thought about Luciano's decision to offer Binas her entire inheritance as her dowry, realizing, I don't care about the gold. Binas can keep it if he would just divorce me. Adding, But he must believe that if he doesn't return the dowry when he's divorcing the imperial princess, he won't be able to stay on the emperor's good side. That must be why he wants to maintain the marriage. She considered the timeline, thinking, It's been twenty-seven days since I heard of Luciano's passing from Bell. Binas will become the emperor if I don't get him to divorce me in three days. While sitting on the bed, she wished for more time, saying to Bell, I think you won the wager, Bell. Please polish my soul stone as prettily as possible. Lying on the bed, she thought, 
Even if I had more time, he would just hear about Luciano's death from somewhere else. At least if I become a soul stone, I won't have to live as Binus's queen until I grow old and die. In the complete silence, she opened her eyes and saw Belle standing there. She said, I thought you'd be more happy when you won. Belle replied, I'm not happy at all. Arnaud asked, Why not? Belle waved his hand, saying, I also said things I want change often. Rising from the bed, she asked, What do you want now? Belle looked at her and added, I want to see you on the throne with a crown on your head. Arnoa was shocked. What? Bell turned back, stating, As the master of the enchanted tower, it would be shameful to become the messenger of an emperor even less capable than Luciano. Bell choked, adding, Soul stones of Cajuns are rare, but it's not worth going through that kind of disaster. Astonished, Arnoa couldn't comprehend. But... Bell raised his hand to his mouth and explained, Wagers with non-sorcerers are just a pastime for me. I do not care if I win or lose. Arnaud asked. You want to help me? Stepping forward, he responded. If I could. However, I still won't be able to harm him with magic. Coming closer, he held her chin, saying. Take his life or lie to him. Those are the rules until I announce the new emperor. Arnaud questioned. Do you think there's a way for me to help you? Laughing, she added. I can think of a few ways. Belle blushed to see her happy. Belle slammed into Binus's room through the window. Binus, sensing someone sneaking in, woke up immediately, flapping, and exclaimed, WH what was that? An assassin? Belle sneaked into Binus's room through the window. Sensing someone's arrival, Binus woke up and exclaimed, WH what was that? An assassin? Belle appeared in front of him, stating, I am the messenger of the empire. Shocked, Binus swished his blanket away and asked, Huh? What is a messenger doing here? Blinking to see him clearly, Binus remembered and laughed. Did the emperor send you because of what happened with the queen? He assured. Tell the emperor that there is nothing to worry about. Even though her behavior is problematic, Dairon will honor the marriage between our two kingdoms. Binus clenched his legs together and continued, I shall never make the queen return to the empire as a divorcee. Should I just break the contract and rip this man apart? Bell gritted his teeth with anger, recalling when he had told Arnoa. Imply that the dowry would not be an issue even if he divorces me. And Ludes will do the rest. Taking a deep breath, Bell thought, That is not why I came, he said to Binus. Here is what I came to tell you. The emperor will not oppose the divorce between the king and queen of Dairon. Binas, astonished, questioned. Is that true? Thinking. He's here to discuss the terms of the divorce. Bell explained. The esteem in which this kingdom holds the empire has already been demonstrated by your behavior in the past. Binas asked about the dowry, adding. Currently, Dairon is not able to give back all of the dowry. Bell stated. The dowry offered by the imperial princess is but a trifle compared to the riches stored in the imperial treasury. It would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations between our two kingdoms over such a trivial matter. Bell asked him. Am I understood? Binas, in utter shock, replied. I understand. With magic, Bell started vanishing, saying. I shall leave the decision to you. Binas smirked and thought. I can end it. I can part ways with that woman without suffering any consequences at all. While shouting, Dr. Lucas rushed to Larissa's room, exclaiming, What? You misdiagnosed? Larissa collapsed upon hearing her scream, and Dr. Lucas informed her, Yes, it's a common mistake. I'm afraid you're not pregnant. Larissa held her belly, saying, No. Dr. Lucas stood beside her, and she added, This is important news. I shall tell his majesty about this at once. Larissa flinched as Dr. Lucas started grabbing the blanket from her. She held his hand to stop him, saying, Didant, if his majesty finds out about this, my father spent so much of his fortune on hiring assassins that our household is one step away from being seized. If he finds out that I'm not pregnant, 
he will be even more reluctant to get a divorce. Dr. Lucas said, All right. I will give you three days to prepare yourself. I cannot hold it off any longer, even if I'm let go as a result. Larissa started thinking. I have three days. After that, things went as expected. Thinking that he wouldn't have to return the dowry, Bynas told Larissa about the messenger that visited him. After seeing a chance, Larissa pressured him to get a divorce. She added, The divorce process, which originally should have taken at least ten days, was shortened to a mere single day due to Larissa's relentless nagging. People whispered in the castle as there was some event. Arnoa arrived there. After seeing guests, she thought, Look at all these people gathered here to become witnesses. This is the first time I've been treated with respect since I came to Duran. Wearing a white and purple royal dress, Bynas turned towards her and asked, You came. Holding a message, Arnoa bowed in front of him, saying, Your Majesty. Bynas ordered her to kneel down, and Arnoa slumped completely in front of him. Bynas started reading the message. Listen carefully. I, King Bynas Roche of the Durand Kingdom, solemnly decree the dissolution of our marriage. Arnoa thought. Finally. Larissa leaned in when he was reading. Arnoa Salyard Cajun, you are hereby stripped of your title as Queen of Duran, as your presence is no longer welcome in this kingdom. Arnoa thought. It's over. Bynas added. You must now return to your home in the capital of the empire. While sitting on the floor, Arnoa was lost in her own thoughts. I finally achieved. She held the message and was very happy. The freedom I've been longing for. She bowed in front of him, saying, We are divorced. I suppose there is no need to keep up false pretenses any longer. Binas was astonished. What? While smiling fully, Arnoa added, I've suffered enough for the past two years, and I couldn't be more grateful to you for ending our marriage. Binas said, Does she fail to grasp what's happened to her? Arnoa replied, Unfortunately, it appears you are the one who fails to grasp what is happening, Binus. He started thinking. How can she be so arrogant now? Binus became furious and started screaming. It seems the shock of the divorce has gotten to your head, but may I remind you? Arnoa fluttered her hair and said. Bell, come out and deliver the emperor's message to the king of Duran. Suddenly, the wind started blowing. They exclaimed. Where is the wind blowing from? What's happening? Bell appeared there, and Binas was shocked to see him, screaming. Huh? What is the Emperor's messenger doing here? Bell replied. Did you not hear the new Empress call for me? Binas asked. The new Empress? Bell informed him. Now that Emperor Luciano and Imperial Prince Arian are dead, and you, Binas Roche Duran, declared the dissolution of your marriage. He added. The empire belongs to none other than her imperial majesty, Arnoa Salyard Cajun. Binas and Larissa fell down in shock, saying, Th this can't be. Arnoa declared, Now for my first order as the empress. I'm sure you recall that when I married you, I brought with me a carriage full of gold as my dowry. She smiled and added, Have it prepared at once. After divorcing Arnoa, Binas deeply regretted his decision upon realizing that the emperor now belonged to Arnoa. Binas found himself kneeling and weeping before everyone, expressing his remorse. My queen, your imperial majesty, I'm on my knees begging you. He cried out pleading, please stay in Duran for a little while longer. Pretty please. Arnoa, irritated by his actions, responded, you sicken me. Binas, rising with excitement, exclaimed, F forgive me, your imperial majesty. Oh, right. Enjoy the feast I've prepared just for you. Contemplating the situation, Arnoa sat on the emperor's chair while Binas continued to beg. I have gathered the finest chefs and dancers in Duran. He instructed the servants. Bring her something. Anything. Adding, as for the head chef, his family has been working for the Duranian royal family for generations. Arnoa questioned him. Really? I don't recall him cooking for me when I was a Duranian royal family member. Binas, becoming furious, tried to defend himself. That? That's? 
rejecting his offer, Arnoa stated. You can keep your precious chef and his dishes. Smiling as she inquired, Are you going to marry Larissa now? Binas hastily replied, It's a misunderstanding, your imperial majesty. Arnoa skeptically responded. Oh? Binas mumbled. I thought the woman was pregnant with my child, and as a man, I felt responsible, so... Immediately, Arnoa thought. Ugh, he's blabbering like an idiot. I should have just left. She remarked sternly. You always had a great sense of responsibility toward your mistress. If only you treated your queen the same way. In response, he shuddered, remaining shocked, and started shouting. I was tricked. Larissa and the court physician both lied to me about her pregnancy. Glancing at Arnoa, he screamed. If it weren't for those two, our marriage would have flourished. Shouting at Larissa, he said, You. Larissa flinched, and Binas growled. Kneel before the Empress. While seated on the royal chair, Arnoa thought, Wow, how petty. He was acting like he would love her until the end of the world. She added, But it didn't take him long to offer me his first love as a scapegoat. As Binas shouted at Larissa, she was shocked and scared, asking, Your Majesty, how could you? Binas grabbed her hand, dragging her, and said, You dare talk back to me? Larissa winced in pain, saying, Oh. Binas came close, commanding, Shut up and kneel, then threw her at the feet of Arnoa. Arnoa glared at her, remarking, This is pathetic. Stop. Binas interrupted, shouting, If it weren't for her, we would have become the couple of the century. He added, After seeing your imperial majesty gazing into the eyes of the master of the enchanted tower. Sniffling, he confessed, I realize that I have been in love with your imperial majesty. Binas continued, I was jealous because your imperial majesty, who was my wife at the time, was with another man. Irritated, Arnoa responded, You must have gone mad. Binas tenderly touched her hand and expressed, Your Imperial Majesty, no, my beloved Arnoa Duran, will you marry me once more? He attempted to kiss her hand, but Arnoa pulled it back, firmly stating, No. Undeterred, Binas insisted, Give it some consideration, Your Imperial Majesty. You have no experience in ruling. Adding, In this cutthroat world of politics, a naive soul like your imperial majesty will get tricked in the blink of an eye and lose everything. Arnoa questioned. A naive soul, you say? Reminding him. Didn't he call me mad a few days ago? Binas continued to argue. On the other hand, I have been ruling as a king for years now. A veteran ruler like me can see right through people just by looking at their faces. Proudly, he declared. I believe your imperial majesty needs a person like me. If you could look past our differences and find generosity in your heart. Arnoa confronted him, saying, Do you take me for a fool? Adding, You becoming the king of Duran was a tragedy, both for me and the people of Duran. Also, for someone with such great insight, don't you think you let yourself be tricked too easily? Upon hearing this, Bainas flinched and clenched his wrist, explaining, That's... That's because it didn't cross my mind that a court physician could lie to me. I have stripped her of her title for making fools out of both of us. Arnoa responded, I'm glad you did. Binas, seeking affirmation, eagerly asked, I did good, yes? Arnoa informed him, I'm taking Dr. Ludes to the Empire with me. Binas, taken aback, started begging, Huh? I beg your pardon? Arnoa smiled and remarked, like you said, a naive soul like me could use the help of wise people. If she tricks someone as insightful as you, she must be quite brilliant. Standing up from the emperor's chair, she commanded, Anyway, King Binas, stop your blathering and bring me my dowry. Her beautiful white and gold carriage was brought there, and Anoa expressed, I'm loving this king's carriage. Maybe it's because it's made with my dowry. Binas began fighting with Larissa's father bringing joy to Arnoa. She thought, it was delightful to watch them fight. Binas, grabbing Larissa's father by the collar, screamed, you, you have been trying to kill the Empress. 
I'm confiscating your assets. However, her father denied the accusation, saying, No. Arnoa contemplated, trying to make each other pay more. Even then, he couldn't pay me back in full, so he had to give up the king's carriage as well. While riding in the carriage, she remarked to Binas, You could pay me in gold. Binas, with a hint of resignation, asked, Do you really have to take it from me? Adding, Please take it. I enjoy walking. Arnoa settled into the carriage, and Belle, already inside, questioned her. So you're sparing the Count, huh? Are you sure that's wise with everything he has done to you? Arnoa replied, Why does it matter? He will bother me no more. Belle acknowledged, That's generous of you. Leaning towards him, Arnoa inquired, I meant to ask, will your duty be finished after you arrive at the Empire? Belle, dressed in royal attire, replied, I suppose so. The new empress has been chosen. Smiling, Arnoa suggested, Belle, don't go back to the Enchanted Tower. Join me in the capital. Belle, surprised, asked, The capital? Blushing, he added, Why would I go to the capital? Wondering if she knew something, he thought, Does she? Arnoa burst into laughter and explained, If you, the Lord of Prahen and the Master of the Enchanted Tower, are there, the nobles won't form a union and give me trouble. She continued, People outside Prahen tend to shun sorcerers. But if you attend noble meetings as a lord, that might change. It's a win-win. Bell, sitting pouting, turned his head and expressed, It might be a win for you, but it's just bothersome to me. Arnoa assured, I knew it. I won't twist your arm. Bell glanced at her and noted, You seem to know something of politics. Arnoa shared, A little, thanks to my mother, for an unknown reason. Emotionally, she added, Mother taught me many things. Perhaps too many. Luciano considered me as a rival ever since Mother taught me disciplines of kingship. Bell declared, Anyway, I cannot stay in the capital. I must return to the tower. Arno asked, Is there something wrong with your domain? Playfully, she placed her hand on her mouth and behaved cute, saying, Oh. Bell observed her, twisting his arms. Arnoa reminisced about her past, sitting beside her mother in a blue royal dress. Her mother patted her head and advised, Arnoa, even the emperor can't meddle with affairs that happen in the domains of sorcerers. Reminding her daughter, she said, Remember, the masters of the enchanted tower have a nasty temper. In the carriage, Arnoa realized, I forgot my mother's teachings after spending some time with Belle. Belle, seated close to her, remarked, That's a dangerous question you're asking. Closing the distance, he inquired, Does this mean you're not afraid of me anymore? Arnoa, feeling scared, stuttered, I'm in danger. Belle smiled, recalling, You were terrified of me when we first met. Blushing, Arnoa smiled and admitted, Sorry, I see snowy when I see you now. In her thoughts, she sighed in relief, thinking, Phew, he doesn't look angry. Belle sat back, being cute, and stated, Officially, my spirit form is a snow leopard. Even Anakin doesn't know what my spirit form is. Arnoa pondered, Must sorcerers have a scary spirit form? When they're actually just a cat and a raccoon? Belle shared, My mother's spirit form was a fire dragon. Astonished, Arnoa exclaimed. A fire dragon? Bell explained. Yes, that's how the masters of the enchanted tower are supposed to be. An invincible force no one can challenge. Arnoa thought. So the great sorcerer Amaryllis was a dragon. Adding. Somehow. I think I understand why she wanted her son's spirit form to be a cat. Smiling, she said. I must say, a cat is cuter. Bell twitched and asked. Cute, you say? Arnoa confirmed. Yes, it's warm when I hug it. Belle glared for a moment, then transformed into a cat, meowing and jumping on her. Arnoa, surprised, said, H, hold on, Belle. You're not a real cat. You're a person. Realizing his provocation, she sighed while hugging him. Ugh, he's provoking me because I called him cute. After confessing her thoughts, Belle started cuddling with her. The next day, in the royal castle meeting room, 
someone wondered aloud. I wonder if he will arrive today. It has been weeks since I heard of the emperor's passing. Where is the new emperor? Questioned Baron Vent, seated at the meeting table. Another person, Duke Rickle, inquired. Have you heard any news from Duran? Marquis Duba replied. I should have, but no. Duke, frustrated, ground his teeth, stating, It's been a month since Anakin Willow sent the messenger, but Duran is strangely quiet. I finished preparing early for nothing. Baron slid his arm on the table, expressing, Did anyone else send a message to Duran? It's absurd they're staying so silent when their king became the emperor. Countess Herman, fully dressed in a party outfit with a diamond necklace, raised her hand and admitted, I did. Well, I tried to anyway. Baron turned to her, asking, What do you mean? Countess sighed, explaining, Strangely, I couldn't even confirm if the message arrived at all. I'm still waiting for the reply. Baron, furious, questioned, What was on your message? Marquis laughed loudly, suggesting, Do you even have to ask? She must have sent her niece's portrait. Baron added, a bold move, offering a mistress to the new emperor who didn't even arrive yet. Countess, irritated, warned him. Don't make a fuss. You must tame the emperor when he's still young and oblivious. Baron dismissed the idea, saying, One might consider that treason. If this emperor is dumb enough to fall for a honey trap, I'll just resign and return to my dominion. Marquis smirked, advising. Broaden your sights. The new emperor is clueless. Someone has to take advantage of him. He continued, I'm sure it's not just Countess Herman and I who are preparing to shower him with gold. Pointing upward with his finger, he boasted, I already prepared the jewels to offer to the emperor. I even had the imperial palace decorated in Duran's color so he can see it when he arrives. Turning to Countess, he wished, Good luck seducing him with a mistress. Countess laughed and replied, The gold you generously offered will be used well by my niece, who is going to be the emperor's mistress. Marquis pointed at Countess and taunted, You don't know, do you? He revealed, The new emperor, Duran's king, already has a mistress whom his majesty loves dearly. Everyone knows a love story in Duran. Countess, contemplating, placed her hand on her chin and said, Hmm, a mistress, huh? Maybe I shall have her killed. Things will get complicated if she gives birth to his child. Marquis laughed, endorsing the idea. Haha, that is not a bad idea. No matter what we bribe him with, when Grand Duke Asselier returns, the new emperor will soon become a mere figurehead. Countess agreed. Then we better make the most of the situation before he returns. Marquis expressed. I'm glad we see eye to eye on this. Turning to Duke Rickle, Marquis asked, You must be over the moon, Duke Rickle. Confused, Rickle inquired, About what, might I ask? Marquis informed him, Your niece became the Imperial Queen. He added, Isn't it nice that the forgotten Imperial Princess is becoming the Imperial Queen just like her mother? No one will lock her in a tower now. Rickle reluctantly agreed. Like you said, it's nice. But as long as Grand Duke Asselier pulls the strings, it's all meaningless. Meanwhile, Arnoa arrived, wearing a white dress with black heels. Marquis, unaware of her identity, asked, W.H., who are you? He screamed, This is a closed meeting. We don't take guests. Arnoa calmly replied, We met a few times when I was young. Have you forgotten me, Marquis Dubert? Rickle, startled, looked at her. Marquis stammered. Pardon me? Arnoa, placing her hand on a chair, said. So you haven't heard? I see word travels slowly around here. Huh? She confidently sat on the royal chair, and Marquis screamed. W.H., what are you? H., how dare you? That seat is reserved for the emperor. Get off. Arnoa smiled and declared. I am the new empress of the empire. Arnoa entered the meeting room and confidently took her seat in the emperor's chair, surprising all the members. She declared, I am the new empress of the empire. Marquis slammed the table, exclaiming, Nonsense! 
Duran's king is the new emperor. Arnoa, with a smirk, responded. Oh, that must be why the palace is overflowing with purple things. Tossing a pillow onto the floor. Panicking, Marquis shouted. What are you doing? Arnoa nonchalantly waved her hand, saying, I'm sick of purple things. Keep things like purple sapphires out of my sight, would you? Marquis, furious, demanded. Enough! Reveal who you are right now! Arnoa retorted. Not the smartest bunch, are you? Did I not just say that I'm the new empress? She turned to Belle, standing beside her, and ordered. Belle, perhaps they need to hear it from you. Belle stepped forward, introducing himself as Belcherius, the master of the enchanted tower and the lord of Perhen. He confirmed. I just returned after fulfilling my duty as the messenger of the empire. Marquis questioned. Belcherius, is she telling the truth? Belle assured him. She is. The empire has a new ruler, and her name is Arnoa Saliard Cajun. The members were astonished, staring at Arnoa. Bell declared, I'll hail the Empress. While Arnoa proudly sat on the Emperor's chair, legs crossed. Baron stood up and exclaimed, Arnoa, the Imperial Princess? Oh my! Baron exclaimed. He added, I didn't recognize your Imperial Majesty because it's the first time I'm seeing you since you went to Duke Rickles Manor. Marquis interrupted, stammering. H, hold on. To my knowledge, the marriage contract between Duran's king and your imperial majesty says that the king will receive the title of emperor. He questioned. Why would your imperial highness become the empress? Did the king of Duran die or something? Arnoa calmly replied. He and I divorced a few days ago. That contract is now null and void. She added with a smile. With Luciano and Arian under the ground, I am the rightful heir to the throne. I am still waiting for you to hail me, so do make it quick. Baron, shocked, glanced at her and hesitantly asked. A all hail the Empress? Arnoa calmly responded. All hail Empress. All hail Empress. She reflected on her past, thinking. It doesn't seem like I'm being welcomed. It doesn't surprise me. Reminiscing about her childhood, she continued. The nobles ignored me when I was young. Some even laughed as I, the imperial princess under the shadow of Luciano, got married off as if I was getting exiled from the empire. Arnoa added, I didn't ask to be on the throne, but it's not that bad now that I'm on it. While sitting on the emperor's chair, she indulged in her own thoughts. What matters now is that I'm here as the new empress. As Arnoa and Belle were in the room, someone entered, exclaiming, Noah! It was Arnoa's friend, Anakin, wearing a pink royal suit. Arnoa, excited, hugged him tightly. She giggled and asked, Why did you have to write the letter like that? Anakin laughed and replied, Ha ha ha, would it kill you to say you miss me first? Belle stood in irritation beside them. Anakin added, I thought of you every day I trust you, but him? Men! Arnoa responded, it was the worst way to say that I should become the empress. Bell stood pouting, and Anakin explained. I was worried the messenger boy might open the letter before you. It was a sort of a safety device. I trust you, but him? Men. He touched her face and continued. But you got the message and became the new ruler. And returned to me. Arnoa, happy to see him, leaned on him and asked. I did, didn't I? Anakin hugged her tightly with excitement. Arnoa pleaded, let go of me. But Anakin insisted, no, I haven't seen you in ages. Arnoa explained, I know, it's just, and as Belle dragged her away, she asked, are you two really friends? Belle said, no, while Anakin said, yes. Belle screamed, I prefer being alone, but he latched on. Anakin, laughing, said, I took pity on this friendless troll and hung out with him at the academy. Arnoa intervened. I can picture what happened. And stopped their fight, saying, Okay, that's enough. Catch up on your own time. She placed her hand on Anakin and said, We have a more pressing matter at hand. Can you guess what it is, Anakin? Anakin knelt and held her hand, saying, Just give me an order, 
your imperial majesty. Arnoa was astonished, and Anakin appointed himself as her official advisor. Bell questioned. Do you trust him? You should sleep on it. Arnoa replied. I do. He's an old friend. She added. Talented individuals like Anakin are extremely rare in the Empire. Anakin was happy to hear the compliment and swore allegiance to her. Bell warned. Be careful. He griffed many people at the Academy. Anakin replied with a smile. Me winning against you at checkers is not grifting. I won because I was good at it, and you were not. Bell got irritated and shouted. Did I tell you that he used to be a lone shark? People lost houses because of him. Anakin retorted. Don't forget to mention that you used to absorb other people's mana and collect soul stones for fun. Arnoa intervened. Enough. I can see you both had a colorful life at the academy. She asked Bell for a moment to talk to Anakin, and Bell jumped on the sofa in response. Arnoa looked at him, sighed, and said, Anakin, how bad is the situation of the Empire? He replied, It's downright awful. She reminisced about her past, saying, While Luciano was sick in bed, the nobles took control of most of the real power. Thus, the nobles are unlikely to submit properly to the new empress. Anakin added, The ones who wield the most power are Grand Duke Asselier and his daughter, Lady Roxanne Asselier. And they will come for you. Arnoa, at the age of ten, stood in her hunting outfit, fervently waving her arms in front of a horse, urging someone holding a sword to sheathe it. Shivering, she pleaded, Sheathe your sword! This horse did its best and won second place. Get out of my way. A red-headed girl named Roxanne, also ten, dragged Arnoa away, declaring, I have no use for a horse that gives me, Roxanne Asselier, second place. In a swift motion, Roxanne splashed the horse with water, and Arnoa exclaimed, Do you see how it's suffering in pain? Roxanne, lifting a blood-dripping sword, blamed Arnoa, stating, It's because you stopped me. Roxanne Asselier, Falling short of first place in a horse riding competition was reason enough for her to put her own horse down. She was much too cruel for a child of her age, just as bad as her father who killed a soldier for not winning a spearmanship competition, perhaps even worse. Anakin informed Arnoa, she kills people nowadays, just like her father. She still doesn't care for losing. Arnoa questioned, then she should have returned victorious by now. Why is she camping in Kesman? Is there a reason for that? Anakin waved his hand, replying, Noah, don't act like you don't know why. There's no better excuse than a war to siphon the Empire's treasury. She's milking the war for all it's worth. Arnoa, reflecting on this, thought, Just as I thought. She added, Roxanne is like the sword of the Empire right now. The problem is that the sword keeps pointing the sharp end to its master. She must have been planning to make Arian the Emperor and play him like a fiddle. She will try to kill me when she hears the news. Anakin smiled and remarked, Well, yes. She knows you're not her lapdog like Arian. Pointing his finger, he said, All the more reason to clean house before the Asseliers arrive. Arnoa inquired, How are the relationships among the nobles? Anakin, smiling, replied, As I said, downright awful. They despise and keep each other in check, Anakin explained, adding. They look down on the imperial family, but at the same time, they're desperate to make people from their families aides of the imperial family. Arnoa questioned him. You turned them against each other, didn't you? Anakin, with a mischievous grin, replied. Who else but little old me? Of course, I did. He elaborated. I did what I could to keep them from forming a union but I'm afraid it won't be that way forever. When they start considering you as an enemy, it won't take long until they form an alliance, even if it's a temporary one. Arnoa contemplated for a moment and said, So, what you're saying is that I need to bring at least one person to my side before that, right? Waving her hand, she asked, Then tell me, which family is powerful enough to stand against the Grand Duke and is likely to stand by my side as well? Anakin revealed, There is only one family, and you know it. They continued discussing the Emperor's current situation seriously. 
Arnoa clenched her hand and said, Accept them. Anakin waved his hand, replying, There is no one else. Arnoa persisted. Think harder. Who do you think would be able to restrain the Grand Duke, the ruler of the North, besides Duke Rickle? Anakin interrupted. The Sovereign of the South? Arnoa considered other options, suggesting. How about Baron Vent? He's relatively loyal and strong, but his family is small. He wouldn't risk bringing his family to ruin for loyalty. There's also Countess Herman. She detests losses. She wouldn't lift a finger unless she was sure she would benefit from aiding you. Arnoa placed her hand on her head, pondering. Ha, would Duke Rickle agree to be on my side? She remembered a moment when guards were dragging her out of the court, crying and wailing. Uncle! Uncle! Her uncle stood still as she screamed. You know me. I would never do such a thing. Arnoa gave a firm order to Anakin. Get me a meeting with him. Anakin bowed, and she added. Go tell him I'm on my way. Anakin replied. As you wish. And turned towards Bell, saying. And aren't you done here? Go home. Lying on the sofa, Bell replied. So this is what you were worried about back in the carriage. Are you planning on making the Duke your ally? Arnoa sighed and replied, I have no other choice since you turned me down. Bell asked, Does that mean I'm your first choice? Arnoa leaned on him and said, If I said yes, would you stay? He rose from the sofa, stating, No. Like Anakin said, I'm done here. I'm going home. Bell declared. Arnoa remarked, It's a shame. I knew you would say that. Bell swished his hair and added, However, I'm planning on returning soon. He smiled and said, The capital is more fun than I thought. Duke Rickle sat on the dining table, drinking tea. Bowing in front of Arnoa, he greeted, Your Imperial Majesty. Arnoa acknowledged, It's been a while, Duke Rickle. Please have a seat. They both sat at the dining table, an awkward silence lingering. Arnoa began, Consider what happened. Rickle interjected, in the past. Arnoa replied, Forgiven. Rickle insisted, Forgotten. Then, he suddenly raised his voice, Forgiven? I believe our family has never wronged you, Your Majesty. Arnoa slammed the table and shouted, Are you saying handing me over to Luciano just because he asked didn't make you feel sorry for me at all? She continued loudly, Three years ago, after Luciano's coronation, you served me up to him on a silver platter when he said he would interrogate me for plotting treason. Arnoa emphasized. I may not be a Rickle, but I am your sister's daughter. No one in his right mind would send off their niece to die just like that. Rickle defended himself. It was the late emperor who forced ill fate upon you, not me, your imperial majesty. Flinching at the table, he added. I did my best at the time. Arnoa asked him sternly. Your best? Did you just say you did your best? Arnoa conversed with her uncle, Duke Rickle. He questioned. Your best? Arnoa sought clarification. Did you just say you did your best? Rickle affirmed. Yes, I did. I did my best to make your imperial majesty stay at my manor as comfortable as possible. Reflecting on her difficult past, Arnoa recounted. During the time between Empress Anastia's death and Luciano's order to have me taken away, I lived as a guest with my mother's relatives, Duke Rickle's family. She added, It was clear that they never thought of me as their family. Everyone was always so polite and treated me like I was made of glass. The Duke never expressed malice toward me or treated me poorly. It was me who had false hope. She reflected, I took out my anger on the wrong person. He is indeed not at fault. She added, Even for the Sovereign of the South, it would have been difficult to defy the Emperor's order. Not only that, I was charged with treason. If Duke Rickle had protected me, House Rickle would have faced charges of treason as well. Even so, I can't help but feel betrayed to some extent. While seated at the dining table, she inquired of Rickle. If you really aimed to do your best, you could have at least told me where I was being taken to. Rickle explained. I couldn't. The late emperor had forbidden me to. 
Arnoa replied. I see. I understand. Being uncertain, she asked him. By the way, what did you mean by forgetting about the past? Rickles screamed out in rage. Isn't it obvious? Arnoa expressed. You've appointed Anakin Willow, the most talented son of House Willow, as your advisor, fully aware that House Willow is a vassal of House Rickle. She added, As the Imperial Advisor, I'm here to request a meeting on behalf of the Empress. Rickle was astonished, clenching his hand and trembling as he said, I have been investing in House Willow for ages. If it had not been for your Imperial Majesty, Anakin would have become my advisor instead. Rickle reminded her, You of all people should be aware that House Rickle highly values talent. He added, Your Imperial Majesty has taken the most valuable asset of my family and the greatest genius in the Empire. He asked her, Did you really think I wouldn't resent you for it? Of course, I know what House Rickle values the most. My mother taught me that. On hearing this, Arnoa was in intense shock. She remembered her mother saying, Remember, Noah, wherever you go, see just one person who has the greatest potential to be your aid, and give that person all of your trust and affection so that they would even risk their life for you if so desired. While reminiscing, she thought, I took her words to heart and tried my best when choosing my aides. Dr. Ludes and Anakin are great examples of that. She immediately realized why her uncle got angry. I can see why the Duke is mad. He's been investing in Anakin, and I just took him away. Rickle clacked a cup of tea and said, That being said, I suppose it's my fault as well. I failed to make my house attractive enough for a genius like him, so I will put this behind me. Arnoa started thinking. Perhaps either of us is in a position to blame each other. She said, Duke Rickle, I have a proposition. On the other hand, a castle was surrounded by fire and people were screaming in distress. Servants wearing white and red dresses were startled and flinched, murmuring. Not a day goes by without her breaking something. One of them whispered to another. I was surprised she agreed to the request of Kessman to halt the battle during the harvest season. Another replied, irritated. I just hope she doesn't take it out on us. A girl wearing a red dress stood, looking at a hole created in the wall. A person said to her, Calm down, Roxanne. She, holding a sword, replied. Calm down? Do you seriously expect me to calm down when the throne has been usurped by a thief? She tossed and threw her sword, saying. Ha! Imperial Princess Arnoa as the Empress? What a sick joke! A red-headed man said to her. Getting upset won't change what happened. Roxanne replied. Are you saying that I'm just throwing a tantrum? Her father added. Of course not, my daughter. I meant. She interrupted him, saying, It's been over a month since Luciano died. Stepping forward, she added, House Asselier is supposed to be the real master of the continent. So tell me why. While grinding her teeth, she said, It took us this long to find out who the next empress is. She screamed in rage. What the hell happened? What caused the late coronation? Why was her divorce right before that? Her father replied, It wasn't our fault. Putting his hand on his face, he said, If anyone is to blame, it's that idiot, Duran's king. He apparently divorced an imperial princess to be with his mistress. He added, Without knowing he might have become the emperor. After hearing this, Roxanne started screaming in rage. I refuse to believe that such a moron exists in this world. Her father replied, Yes, it was hard to believe for me as well. He even had to return all of his former queen's dowry, including the jewels of Empress Anastia. Roxanne asked him, Who are we up against? He added, You said it yourself? He's a moron. Roxanne asked again, I meant the Empress. Her father laughed and said, Don't worry. She is painfully ordinary. Roxanne didn't understand, so she asked for an explanation. Please elaborate. Her father started telling her. She was born to the imperial family, but she couldn't even get educated properly since her mother died early. She let a weakling like Luciano abuse her, and she even let that moron of Duran and his mistress walk all over her. 
he added, the hardest thing she went through in her life is her divorce. Roxanne commented. She was basically a punching bag. The throne deserves better. She started thinking. That's what became of Empress Anastia's daughter. Wasn't she more like? Her father was saying. In other words, she will make a better puppet than Arian. Roxanne said. Then let us send a warning. She stomped on the sword and said, A warning more direct than what we sent to Duran's king. The Empress will kneel before House Asselier or die. All the members have gathered for the meeting with Anoa. One of them remarked, So the princess, no, the Empress returned to the Empire after getting a divorce? Another individual engaged in conversation with a man beside him, stating, Duran's king, who adores his mistress, declared a divorce with her imperial majesty soon after the late emperor passed away. Meanwhile, Marquis interjected. He gave up the chance to have the entire continent for a mistress, huh? I must say, that was the most idiotic move in history. Adding to the discussion, Marquis continued. I can't believe such a moron exists on the continent. Another person seated in front of him remarked. He must not have known. I heard he got sick from crying too much. Addressing the political implications, one of them questioned. Does that mean our new empress came to power because she got divorced? The conversation at the table revolved around the new empress, with someone sharing. She was the youngest among three siblings, and she lost her mother early. She probably doesn't know much about politics. Another person chimed in. She would have to depend on us, the nobles, then. A young man, adorned in brown and black royal attire, declared, I shall see if I can get one of my people to become her aide. Baron, seated in front of him, replied, I don't know. She didn't seem that naive to me. Ah, uh, you won't fool me. The response came swiftly. You say that, but I know you're just trying to beat me to it. Offended, Baron retorted, I'm not. Meanwhile, someone alerted them. The Empress has come. Arnoa, adorned in a beautiful white royal dress, entered the room. As everyone stood up to greet her, they bowed, saying, Your Imperial Majesty. Arnoa graciously took her seat on the Emperor's chair, stating, Thank you for your warm welcome. Have a seat. Anakin stood beside her chair, capturing everyone's attention. The members contemplated. So she is the new Empress. Actually, unlike the rumors, she doesn't look naive at all. Arnoa began addressing the gathering, expressing gratitude. I am grateful to all of you who have been keeping the troubled empire together until now. Flipping a paper, she continued. Let us begin the meeting. I believe there is an issue about the war with Kessman. Sir Dubert? Murmurs circulated as she delved straight into the topic. Marquis, taken aback, asked, so suddenly, your imperial majesty? Arnoa replied, Are you not prepared? It was you who reported it, was it not? Marquis, momentarily rattled, admitted, It was me indeed. Thinking, I was planning to ease into it, but here we go. Standing up, Marquis informed her, Currently, Grand Duke Asselier is engaged in fierce battles alongside the Grand Duchess against the Kingdom of Kessman. Not so long ago, there was even the tragedy of the special force, organized by the Grand Duke, being annihilated by the enemy. Arnoa flipped a page, frowned, and remarked, Ah, yes! The unit made of Duranians. Marquis couldn't help but think, How does she know that? Flinching, he replied, And as you well know, funds are needed to overcome such adversities. While holding the paper, Arnoa inquired, did the Grand Duke request funds from the Empire again? Continuing, she stated, According to the record, it's the third time this year. Marquis cleared his throat and explained, It has been a difficult war. However, Arnoa interrupted, Difficult, is it? Even with ten times more soldiers than Kesman? The Kesmanian army must be quite formidable. Marquis, taken aback, thought, Did she just mock the Grand Duke? He twitched and replied, Kesman has rugged terrain. That allows the Kesmanians to have an advantage in battles. Arnoa sighed, stating, To my knowledge, the military funds allocated for this year have all been depleted by the last request. 
she questioned. How would the Empire raise funds on such short notice? Marquis, attempting reassurance, laughed and said, There is nothing to be worried about, your Imperial Majesty. The funds requested by the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess are actually not as much as you might think. He even specified when and how to obtain the funds. Smirking, he added, He said your Imperial Majesty's dowry that was returned after your divorce would suffice. It was a carriage filled with gold and a pair of black diamonds, was it not? On hearing this, Baron immediately chimed in. Arnaud pondered. Wow. He wants me to hand over the dowry I got back in the name of military funds? She was well aware of their intentions, asserting. The dowry someone brings to their marriage belongs only to them. No one can take it away, as it's private property. Emphasizing her point, she added. Even a husband must return it when he gets a divorce. Asking to hand that over means that he is blatantly asking for my obedience to him, the army commander of the empire. Marquis, seemingly dismissive, flipped his arms and said, I know it must be offensive, your imperial majesty, but you must swallow your pride. He continued, Look at the bigger picture. Had the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess not defended the North, the empire might have already collapsed. There is no one who can replace the Grand Duke as the army commander. He placed his hand on his forehead, with his thumb pointing down to his eyes, smirking as he said, If your Imperial Majesty knew the significance of this war, you would accept the Grand Duke's request. Baron thought, The man sure has a silver tongue. Arnoa rustled her hand on the paper and acknowledged, I understand. The late Emperor did leave the war effort solely to the Grand Duke. Laughing, Marquis clapped and exclaimed, Exactly! You should show your gratitude to the Grand Duke by offering him your private property as the military funds. Arnoa turned to the other members, inquiring, Is there anyone who is against this idea? Marquis added confidently, Against you say? Arnoa suggested, Would a peace treaty not be better than prolonging a war with an uncertain end? One person, Sir Nore, chimed in, your Imperial Majesty must not know what the Empire has gone through lately. Sir Nori complimented. Although we're currently in a year-long stalemate, the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess have saved the Empire from the crisis of collapse several times. Arnoa thought. A crisis of collapse, he says? The Cajun Empire that practically spans the entire continent? Yeah, right. Nori supported Marquis's suggestion. He speaks the truth. The Grand Duke is the savior of the empire. Adding to the argument, Nori mentioned. Moreover, the fiancé of the Grand Duchess recently perished in a battle against the enemy, so there should also be compensation as consolation for her loss. Marquis added with a smirk. In fact, I'm not sure the return dowry alone is enough. A person sitting beside him agreed. I agree. Arnoa, realizing the manipulative tactics, thought. So this is how they want to play it, huh? She declared. I've heard enough. To tease her, Marquis said. Should we go fetch the carriage? Arnoa calmly replied. No. With a smile, she added. Like you said, I still am clueless about the recent situation of the Empire. Marquis, flinching at her response, asked. Then why not just do as we advised? Arnoa tapped on the table and asserted. No, let's put a pin in that for now. I am not ignoring your advice. I understand what you want me to do very well, and I need some time to think about it. Shocked glances were exchanged among the members. Nori thought, she'll do as we say in the end. Smirking, there is no way she can defy the Grand Duke. All she can do is to reject a few times to save face. Arnoa handed over a notepad to Anakin and said, As for this matter... I will decide what to do in the next meeting after giving it due consideration. She added, You can write a letter to me if you have any opinions until then. Let us conclude the meeting. Arnoa started leaving, and Anakin offered, Your Majesty, allow me to take you to the audience chamber. She turned back and ordered, Let's go. Reflecting on her conversation with Duke Rickel, she reminisced, Duke Rickel, I have a proposition. A proposition? For me? I know that Rickles never betray their own family. 
It's one of the things my mother taught me, she added. My mother was a rickle, yet I carry Cajun's name. I understand that is why it is hard for you to accept me as a member of House Rickle. That must also be the reason why you're reluctant to stand by my side immediately. A girl with blonde hair, wearing a beautiful royal blue dress, greeted Arnoa, saying, Your Imperial Majesty, Penelope Rickle, at your service. A girl with blonde hair, wearing a beautiful royal blue dress, greeted Arnoa, saying, Your Imperial Majesty, Penelope Rickle, at your service. Arnoa fluttered her arms, remarking, it's good to see you again, Penelope. It's been three years. Perplexed by the lack of response, she called out. Penelope? The girl remained silent, not uttering a word. Arnoa, trying to lighten the mood, teasingly asked. Penelope, didn't you miss me? Suddenly, Penelope started crying, expressing grief. Noah! She rushed towards Arnoa, hugging her tightly and exclaimed. Your Majesty! Arnoa reminisced about their childhood. Penelope was the only one at Duke Rickles Manor who talked to me. She recalled a moment when Penelope, as a child, brought her doll and requested Arnoa to play, saying, Play with Penny, Noah. Arnoa, asserting her status as an imperial princess, replied sternly, I'm an imperial princess. You shall address me as your highness. Unfazed, Penelope persistently requested, Play with Penny, your highness. An irritated Arnoa demanded, I meant you should be more respectful. Penelope, not giving up, pulled back her doll, saying, Come on, your highness. She even tried to drag Arnoa by pulling her arm. Arnoa, still standing, chuckled. Um, providing an introduction to Penelope, she shared. Penelope only had two elder brothers. Maybe that's why she considered me as her sister and asked me to play with her relentlessly. Reminiscing, Arnoa added, She'd still like me even after she became a teenager and when I was forcefully sent to the Imperial Palace. Penelope, still sniffling after the heartfelt hug, expressed, I was thrilled when I heard your majesty asked for me. Arnoa, equally happy to meet her, patted her head affectionately and said, It's so nice to see you again. The relationship between Arnoa and Penelope was like that of sisters, and Penelope was overwhelmed by the reunion, thinking, She's like the sister I never had. I wouldn't have blamed you even if you changed your attitude toward me after so many years. But here you are, still giving me a warm welcome. She added, I was right to call for you. Arnoa, maintaining their familiar bond, said, You can call me Noah when we're alone. Penelope, in acute response, replied, But my father told me specifically not to do that. Arnoa playfully commented. You've grown up. Good. That's how a lady-in-waiting should be. Penelope hesitated a bit after receiving this compliment. Arnoa, noticing her hesitation, asked. A lady-in-waiting. Don't you want to be one? You're free to return if you don't. Penelope replied immediately. I do. I'm happy to be your majesty's lady-in-waiting. Arnoa, sensing there might be more, asked. But... Penelope took a sigh and admitted, I understand that, your imperial majesty. Holding Arnoa's hands with love, she explained, Offered to make me serve you to form an alliance with House Rickle. But that is not enough for people to think the Rickles and the imperial family have a true alliance. Penelope added. Arnoa contemplated, thinking, It's not too late. Your majesty should seek other noble houses of power to form an alliance with. She shared, Duke Rickle also pointed that out, recalling their conversation when he clicked the cup on the table and expressed, I see. Your Majesty wants to become family with House Rickle. It is an honor that your Imperial Majesty wants Penelope as your lady-in-waiting. He sighed, adding, But I'm afraid that is not enough to call ourselves family. Then let me show you. Arnoa, with a smile, reminisced, Just how much trust one put in House Rickle she thought. Also, an alliance was not the sole purpose of my offer. Calling out to Penelope, she said, Penelope. Arnoa continued, No lady-in-waiting other than her will worry about things such as whom I form an alliance with. There isn't a single noble woman I trust more than you. 
patting her face politely, she added, You should focus on your own future rather than worrying about such things as a lady-in-waiting should. Stepping forward, she asked, Is there anything you want for your future? Come sit with me. Penelope, not fully understanding, questioned. For my future? Arnoa sat on the sofa, casually flopping her legs, and said, Is it a marriage or a title you seek? A lady-in-waiting of the Empress can have it all. Penelope replied, Actually, I'm interested in either of those. Penelope, expressing her ambition, gestured towards her neck and declared, I want to be at the center of high society, as the late Empress Anastia, who was called the treasure of the empire, once was. She added, Her imperial majesty was famous for her tremendous power and wealth, but I've heard her wit and charm were so impressive that they remain memorable even after her passing. It is said that her imperial majesty was able to prevent a war with just her eloquence. I want to be like her. I think I can help you with that. Arnoa, supportive of Penelope's aspirations, asked, Penelope, have you had a debutante ball yet? Penelope replied, No, your majesty. Arnoa stepped forward, stating, Let me throw a glamorous debutante ball for you, right here in the imperial palace. The next day, the palace garden was transformed into a grand party venue, filled with royal guests and meticulous arrangements. Every detail was decorated with precision, and delicious food adorned the tables. Penelope, dressed in a yellow royal gown, danced joyfully with a partner, captivating the attention of all the guests. Anakin, expressing his concern, asked Arnoa, The first event after your accession should have been for your coronation, not Lady Penelope's debutante ball. Are you sure this is the theme of the ball you want, your majesty? Arnoa, sipping her drink, confidently replied, I am. People have gathered, haven't they? Anakin sighed and remarked, A ball prepared for a lady-in-waiting? Who benefits from this? Arnoa grinned a little while holding her drink and replied, Follow the people's gazes. She added, At this mind-blowingly lavish and overwhelmingly luxurious party, the debutante is commanding all the attention in the center of the hall. Two girls, whispering after seeing the arrangements, commented, A debutante ball at the Imperial Palace? I'm dying of jealousy. Another chimed in. Lady Penelope's dress is absolutely fabulous, too. Arnoa, sharing the excitement with Anakin, laughed and said, Did you hear that? They think highly of Penelope. Hence, I'm benefiting. And the finale hasn't even started. Hee <laughs> hee. Anakin, inquiring about the plan's success, asked, Do you think this plan will work? Arnoa, clinking her drink at the table, confidently replied, I had your help with the plan. The chance of it failing is slim. Anakin pressed, But what if it fails? Arnoa, taking a chocolate cupcake in her hand and smiling at him, remarked, Well, I'll still be giving my beloved cousin a gift. A guy commented to a red-headed girl holding a hand fan and wearing a red dress. What a grand ball. I guess coming from House Rickle has its benefits. Another guy standing beside them pondered. I don't know. Her Imperial Majesty still doesn't have her people at the Imperial Palace. The red-headed girl explained. My mother said this was just a means for the Empress to demonstrate to people how well she treats her only lady-in-waiting. The guy speculated. Maybe her Imperial Majesty is trying to get House Rickle to side with her completely. The red-headed girl dismissed the notion, saying, That's a silly notion. It will take more than a lavish ball or an expensive dress to persuade Duke Rickle. His treasury is so full that even the cutlery at his manor is all made of gold. She emphasized, Duke Rickle wouldn't bat an eye even if she dressed, spoke, and behaved exactly like the late Empress to evoke his memory. After all, she's not the late Empress. If all she can offer to win the favor of the Sovereign of the South is a mere fancy ball. Meanwhile, Duke Rickle arrived and turned to look at them for a moment. The red-headed girl concluded, Then that's her limit as the former queen of the small realm of Duran. Arnoa, excitedly ready to unveil the red box, asked Anakin, Shall we begin? Arnoa reminisced about her parents' lives. Anastia, the former head of House Rickle and a leader of high society, 
received a pair of black diamonds from Emperor Gaolin Pele's Cajun, my father, when he proposed her to be his second queen. Despite her little interest in rubies as red as blood or emeralds as vivid as life, she had a fondness for black gems, and he knew just the thing to captivate her. A pair of black diamonds that sparkled as if they held the depths of the night sea and the luminous stars of the universe. You will become the treasure of the empire. I wish to gift you the most beautiful thing in my possession. This incident became such a romantic tale that it made black gems a trend across the entire empire. In the palace, a grand event unfolded, with every corner adorned with decorations. Royal guests filled the halls, accompanied by the soothing strains of soft music. Arnoa, resplendent in a blue royal dress, greeted her sister, Penelope, who wore a golden frock with warmth. Penelope, my sister whom I adore, is the banquet to your liking? Penelope, bowing before her, replied, Of course, your imperial majesty. You held it just for me. I will serve your majesty with all my heart as your lady-in-waiting. Arnoa, sensing Penelope's humility, commanded, Raise your head, Penelope. As Penelope complied, she asked, Your majesty? Arnoa clarified, I held this banquet as your sister and not as the empress. So today, I wish to see you happy as my sister and not as my lady-in-waiting. Penelope, touched, expressed her gratitude. Thank you, your imperial majesty. Beside Arnoa stood Anakin, holding a red box. Arnoa stepped forward, presenting Penelope with a gift to bless her future. Penelope, I have prepared a gift to bless your future. You will become the treasure of the empire. Anakin opened the box, revealing a stunning necklace adorned with a black, huge diamond. I wish to gift you the most beautiful thing in my possession. Other guests were visibly surprised upon seeing the necklace. They began whispering amongst themselves. I remember that phrase. It was that color, that size. It must be the late Empress's. My goodness, I thought her imperial majesty would wear it herself. Meanwhile, her father arrived in a red and golden royal attire, his eyes filled with tears. A lady wearing a gray dress approached him, remarking, My, my, a bold move. She just gifted her cousin the reputation that was once carried by the late empress and the legacy of her mother. Even a real sister wouldn't be so generous. She then congratulated Duke Rickle, saying, Congratulations, Duke Rickle. Whether you want it or not, your daughter now inherited Empress Anastia's name, joining the imperial family and House Rickle once more. Duke Rickle, experiencing mixed emotions, found himself in an emotional state. Then let me show you just how much trust one put in House Rickle. Arnoa wore her necklace with love, and Penelope was also very happy, laughing out loud. Duke Rickle found himself lost in thoughts. As long as Penelope carries the name of the treasure of the empire, the epitome of Anastia, no one will separate the imperial family from House Rickle in their thoughts. The lady in grey interjected once more, stating, I thought the banquet was just a shallow plan to gain favor. For someone who was ignored even in a small kingdom, she sure made a remarkable move. Duke Rickle smiled and remarked, She's crafty just like my sister used to be. Penelope shared her feelings with Arnoa, expressing, I'm so happy, your majesty. Arnoa smiled in response and thought, With this, Penelope will now become the successor of Anastia Rickle. With that kind of title, it'll be much easier for her to rise to the top of high society. Arnoa then asked Penelope, Have you picked your next dance partner yet? She replied, No, your majesty. Arnoa suggested, I see Anakin dance with her, will you? Both Anakin and Penelope were taken aback by the suggestion, with Anakin pondering. Why me? Huh? That lady immediately taunted the boys standing there. Don't you see, men over there eager to be her next dance partner? A guy embellished in a green dress declared. I'm next. Others grew furious, each vying to dance with her. No, I'm. The lady added. If she dances with the wrong person when she's at the center of attention, people might mistake the partner for one of my people. Arnoa, standing still, glanced at them, feeling awkward. She added, We can't have that today. 
At least not now. Arnoa and Penelope both smiled and agreed. As you wish, your majesty. Meanwhile, Anakin whispered in Arnoa's ear, saying, But promise me that your majesty will let me dance with you when I return. Arnoa smiled and replied, If I must. He took Penelope's hand and left for dancing. Arnoa called her servant. Lord Chamberlain. He replied, Yes, your imperial majesty. She fluttered her dress and said with a smile, I'm going to take a walk in the gardens. Let the musicians play whatever they want to. He replied, Of course, your majesty. After the event, she sat at the edge of the fountain, letting out a sigh. My legs hurt from standing for too long. She paused, reminiscing her conversation with Anakin. Doesn't your majesty think it's a shame? When Arnoa was handing Anakin the necklace, she asked, H.M.? What do you mean? Anakin replied, Your majesty didn't have a debutante ball either. You had no one celebrate you. I wish the first event would honor your majesty. While pondering, Arnoa saw her shadow in the water. The boat has sailed. There's no point in having regrets now. She rustled for a moment and added, Regrets will only hold me back. Huh? Meanwhile, Bell arrived in his cat form, jumping at her and starting to cuddle. Snowy! You got cuter! Meow! Come here! Bell hugged her and said while transforming into his human form. Would you stop hugging me already? Arnoa became disappointed, saying, It was Snowy I was hugging, not you. Bell got furious, retorting, don't act so disappointed, Arnoa added. I thought you'd be at the Enchanted Tower. Bell sighed and said, I told you I'd return. He extended his hand towards her, surprising Arnoa, who asked, WH, what are you doing? He replied, Isn't dancing a thing at debutante balls? Arnoa started laughing, saying, Well, it's not my debutante ball. She swished her hand with his, and Bell held her, drawing closer, saying, H.M., I don't care. I came to see the Empress. Luca, in his spirit form as a raccoon, was busy washing oranges kept in a basket, splashing them with water. While washing, he noticed Bell coming forward, spinning his arm in his blue and white royal dress. Luca asked him, Oh, you're back. Taking a bite of an orange, Bell replied, I told you that you should come back early because the portal closes at midnight. It was this close to closing. Bell comfortably sat in the flip-flop chair, flicking his finger. And I told you multiple times that you don't have to wash fruits grown with magic because they're clean. Luca insisted. All food must be clean before eating. Bell took a sigh, remarking. I've never seen a sorcerer who's more affected by their spirit form than you, Luca. When Luca offered him an orange, Bell politely declined. Luca then inquired about the event. Anyway, how was the ball? Bell rested his head along the chair, stating, The ball was... People were drinking and dancing on the other side, but in the gardens, it was like we were the only ones left on earth. He reminisced about himself and Arnoa in the garden, so close to each other. The beautiful gardens and the sound of nature all faded away, and the only thing I could sense was Arnoa's presence. Bell grinned. Enjoyable. While eating fruit, Luca remarked, I see you have put my teachings to use. It was worth it to sneak into the classroom in the Imperial Palace to teach you how to dance. Bell replied, Or you could have just paid the fee and learned dancing there in human form. It did help, though. He reminded Luca of their practice sessions for dancing. Luca, now in his human form, fluttered his arms, saying, I'm so proud, I knew it'd help. Bell stared at him and then added, You don't dance as well as I thought. Luca stiffened with shock. Excuse me? Bell sighed, explaining. The Empress had a more upright posture, and she didn't wobble like you do. Luca dropped the fruit and started sobbing, telling Bell. She grew up with Anakin Willow. The man has the most elegant footwork in the Empire. Bell was taken aback, thinking. He does. Luca added. He danced so well. No sorceress turned him down when he seduced them with his moves back in the Academy of Magic. He mumbled. Hadn't you heard? Of course, she dances well. She grew up with him. 
Then he pouted his face and started innocently. Well, I taught you well enough to dance with ease, didn't I? Bell replied. It wasn't easy. Luca became agitated and asked. It wasn't. Bell scratched his head, trying to cover up. It was fun, but so tiring as well. Glaring at him, Bell questioned. Why didn't you tell me that your heart beats faster when you dance? Luca was clueless. What are you talking about? Bell exclaimed. You should have given me a heads up if the exercise could strain my body. Luca, holding his tail, was astonished. Huh? How can dancing strain your body? Even poisons do nothing to your body. You were fine when you danced with me. After a moment of thought, he said, Maybe the body enhancement magic the dark lady cast on you has worn off. Bell shouted again. It hasn't worn off. Would you stop calling my mother the dark lady? Luca replied. I heard people called her that back in the day. Should I address her as the cannibalistic dragon instead? Bell scolded him, saying, Just shut your mouth. Luca, hesitant, asked Bell. Master, I was waiting for the right time to tell you this, but the fifth child of House Leighton had a seizure again. Bell frowned, remarking, It's the fifth time this year. Luca, standing beside his chair, inquired, Will you give the same treatment as the last time? Bell sprang a little from his chair and affirmed, Yes. I don't have a proper cure. The parents would want me to as well. Interrupting him, Luca said, You said that there might be a cure. Bell flinched. That a soul stone of a member of the imperial family might do the trick. The empress is the only member of the imperial family you have access to right now. Maybe you should try her again. Bell called him. Luca. But Luca didn't listen, adding. She was willing to offer her soul stone for a wager. That means she's not too eager to live. If you could persuade her somehow to give up half of her life. After hearing this, Bell got furious. He grabbed Luca's neck and said, I'm warning you, Luca. If you speak of the Empress in that manner ever again, I will flay your skin and make a rug for her. Do you understand? Luca replied, I understand. I will never tell you to get the Empress's soul stone again. Bell let him go, and Luca started coughing while holding his neck. I'm just a feeble raccoon, you mean it. Bell turned back and said, We're going to the Leightons. I'll see if I can find a clue to the cure once I get there. Meanwhile, Anakin was removing Arnoa's shoes as she lay on the bed, saying, You're a genius, Anakin. Anakin responded, You're too kind. It was your majesty's idea to make Lady Penelope the successor of Anastia. Let me take your shoes off for you. Arnoa added, It was you who said we should use the phrases my father said to my mother. It was also you who found out what the phrases were and how to play it to the nobles. Rising from the bed, she asked him, Did Duke Rickle leave me any messages before he left? Anakin replied, No, he left soon after the ball ended. But I did encounter Lord Damien. Arnoa reminded herself of a guy dressed in a golden royal dress, saying, He's Penelope's eldest brother. The second son, Balin, must have been there too. He said he was surprised, but he seemed to be proud of Lady Penelope. Luca told her. Arnoa started laughing, saying, That must mean the Duke was pleased. She took a sigh and said, I'm done for today. Anakin creaked his hand on the bed and leaned towards her, saying, I'm afraid you have one more task. Your majesty still owes me a dance. Arnoa started sweating and replied, Sorry, I forgot after I went out to the gardens. Anakin sniffled and said, How could you? I was waiting for you while dancing with Lady Penelope against my will. Was dancing with Belle instead of me fun for you, your majesty? Arnoa laughed out loud and remarked, he is a strange one. He showed up without being invited and left when I asked him to stay. A cat. As she said it, she flinched, thinking, Does Anakin know Bell's real spirit form? Anakin started thinking, saying, His spirit form is a snow leopard, though. Arnoa replied, Ah, uh, yes it is. Anakin sighed and added, He doesn't know. Good for Bell for hiding it. I advise you not to get too deeply involved with the master of the Enchanted Tower. He's unpredictable. 
You never know what might trigger him to turn against your majesty and cause great harm. Anakin cautioned. Arnoa realized. I understand why Anakin is warning me. He's doing it to protect me. It's true that he is whimsical, but every time he killed someone, but Bell is. She sat on the bed and said, I should prepare for tomorrow's meeting. With a swish, she smiled. Let's think of a way to show Marquis Dubert who holds the power. Anakin replied, I've been waiting for you to say that. Arnoa attended the meeting with the Empress members. Marquis was standing at his place, screaming, This matter can't wait any longer. As I said at the last meeting, the war with Kessman needs more funds. He shook his hand towards his head and continued, Your Imperial Majesty gave away the most valuable thing from the return dowry, so we must find something else to fill the hole it left. He suggested, How about replacing it with the Opal Ring Reutemann II once owned? Arnoa ignored him and asked, Any other suggestions? She turned to the other members and inquired, Is everyone in agreement with that? All were silent until Baron raised his hand. Baron Vent. He introduced himself and started. The war must end quickly for the sake of the Empire. Arnoa immediately agreed. I agree. What's your suggestion? Bell stood from his chair and added, Therefore, keeping the soldiers we have instead of recruiting more, and actively attempting to achieve a peace treaty seems logical to me. Arnoa pondered. He doesn't seem to think he can make a difference, since the Grand Duke has the nobles under his thumb, but it's clear that he's against the Grand Duke and Marquis Dubert. So there's hope if he's brave enough to express his opinion. Marquis grew furious, slamming the table and screaming. How ignorant of you to say so! We already tried to make peace with Kessman, but they're all savages who can't be reasoned with. If word gets out that the capital hesitates to support the soldiers who are defending the North day and night, their morale will plummet. He added, The Grand Duke stated that the forces of Kessman are so mighty that if we don't press harder and continue to attack them, they might come to attack the capital. Meanwhile, Anakin arrived and handed some papers to Arnoa. Arnoa glanced at them and said, I don't understand. She appeared indifferent in this situation and continued, I thought we deployed an army to avoid that. According to the last three funds requests, the funds the late emperor sent alone were enough to build ten palaces in Kessman. Arnoa tossed the papers on the table. Marquis flustered and retorted, Your imperial majesty must not know because you only ascended to the throne recently, but in war, it's uncertain how much capital will be required. To end the war quickly, we must grant the Grand Duke's request. And if another kingdom invades the empire, who will come back to defend the capital? Arnoa realized. This is the card the Grand Duke and the Marquis have been using to pressure the nobles and the imperial family. The reason why it's not easy for the nobles to decline their shameless demands is that gathering large armies and leading them is hard for the nobles to manage. It's been a while since House Rickle stepped away from politics, and the Grand Duke used this vacancy of power to force the nobles to obey him. He's been blackmailing them that he might withdraw at the most crucial moment and let the capital get attacked, subtly but constantly. Luciano must have had no other choice than to keep supporting his war efforts, since with a diminished army, there was no one else to defend the empire against other kingdoms. That's why the Grand Duke was able to drag out this stupid war for four years. Arnoa frowned at his sayings. He added, There were only a few occasions when the late emperor did not follow his opinion. Meanwhile, he's thinking, You're going to succumb in the end, anyway. Just say yes already. Arnoa took a sigh and said, I'm aware of the late emperor's policies. But I'm the empress now, not him. She added, And according to you and the Grand Duke... It seems like all the soldiers who should be guarding the empire are in the north, leaving the empire so vulnerable that it could be invaded at any moment. Marquis was taken aback. Arnoa continued, If Kessman is that formidable, the Grand Duke should have requested reinforcement in case they do make it to the capital. Instead, he's been asking for more and more funds and done nothing with them to end the war. Maybe it's time we considered other options to resolve this matter. I'm open to suggestions. There was silence as no one spoke up. 
Duke Rico offered his suggestion, stating, Be it an army or a commander, if there is anything your imperial majesty requires, House Rickle will provide. I shall put my eldest son, Damien, in charge and send soldiers. Arnoa was elated. She smiled and thanked him, saying, You have no idea what a relief it is for me to hear your decision. Other members began whispering amongst themselves, expressing surprise at Duke Rickle's unexpected offer. They noted, Oh, I didn't expect Duke Rickle, the sovereign of the South, to step up to protect the capital. The Rickles seemed to no longer be merely bystanders in politics. They're clearly on the imperial family's side now. Wait, if House Rickle provides their army, what the Marquis has been saying loses its meaning. Marquis started shouting, And nonsense! Please reconsider, your imperial majesty. Arnoa calmly replied, Why would I reconsider? Marquis waved his hand frantically, insisting, Protecting the capital is a duty of great importance. You can't decide who will take on the duty as soon as someone volunteers. Count Nori interjected loudly. Marquis Dubert is right. Even though Duke Rickle is your majesty's uncle, you cannot leave the security of the capital to one house. If the duke ever decides to overthrow. Duke Rickle interrupted, addressing Count Nori sternly. You're out of line, Count Nori. Marquis continued. I can't agree to this, your imperial majesty, unless someone promises to share the responsibility with the Rickles and keep them in check. Arnoa felt irritated by his demand, thinking to herself. He was fine with letting House Asselier be the sole protector of the capital. Look at him contradicting himself as soon as things don't suit him. Despite this, she maintained her composure and added aloud. However, it's nothing I haven't anticipated. Suddenly, the main door opened, prompting Marquis to ask nervously, W.H., what is going on? Arnoa advised him. You might want to step away from the door. Marquis, taken aback, apologized. I beg your pardon? A cat appeared at the table, causing everyone to react with shock and confusion. Countess Herman exclaimed, Eek! W.H., why is there a beast in the Imperial Palace? Baron added, how did it get in? Arnaud greeted. Look who's finally here. The man of the day. Bell appeared in his human form, twirling Arnaud's hair, and apologized. I'm sorry for being late. Excuse my bold entrance. People began to chatter, expressing surprise. Master Belcherius? The master of the enchanted tower came to the meeting. I've heard the high-class sorcerers can morph into animals, but that was a beast. Bell placed his tail on his shoulder and addressed Arnoa. I overheard the conversation. So, you need someone to keep House Rickle in check, yes? I'll do it. Marquis interrupted, shouting, Who hasn't cared about the Empire's affairs at all? And Perhan doesn't even have an army big enough to fight the Rickles. Bell inquired, An army? Why would I need that? Marquis, astonished, asked, Huh? What are you? Bell cracked his teeth and clarified, I am the army, adding, By that, I mean I will come to your aid when you need me. Arnoa responded, It's great to have the powerful lord of Perhen. Well then, now that the Marquis's worries are resolved, I'm declining the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess's request. Marquis seethed with anger. Arnoa continued with a smile, And I'm sure the Grand Duke's hands are full. Thus, I'm planning on sending a representative to negotiate with Kessman on the imperial family's behalf. At the conclusion of the meeting, Arnoa declared her decision. I'm planning on sending a representative to negotiate with Kessman on the imperial family's behalf. The Baron appeared surprised when Arnoa announced. I shall grant Baron Vent full authority over this negotiation. Upon hearing this, the Marquis began to voice his concerns. Are you saying you're replacing the person in charge of the war, your majesty? He then asked her. Why did you suggest entrusting Baron Vent with the negotiation? Arnoa replied. Because he is a man of principle who won't be swayed by the Grand Duke's words. She recalled her earlier conversation with Anakin as she sat on the sofa, while Anakin poured tea nearby, filling the room with the sound of pouring tea. While serving her tea, Anakin mentioned. 
If we send him to the negotiation, he will likely produce results in less than a month. Herb tea, your majesty? Arnoa accepted the cup and replied. Thank you. As she sipped her tea, she remarked. Good, I won't have to lift a finger then. You wish bringing those who went to the north back is just the beginning of cleaning up this mess. Anakin moved closer and explained. To proceed with the negotiation with Kessman by putting Baron Vent in charge, the support of Duke Rickle is absolutely necessary. There's no one else who possesses power comparable to the Grand Dukes. Arnoa sighed and added, Yet the Duke has hardly set foot in the Imperial Palace for almost a decade. The nobles of the Grand Duke's faction will use that against him. Anakin pointed out, As of now, it's likely that they'll say he might commit treason and argue that there should be someone who can keep him in check. Astonished, Arnoa asked, Would they really make such an absurd claim? She then clinked her cup of tea as Anakin continued. Who could match the power of Duke Rickel, the Sovereign of the South? I might regret saying this, but the Lord of Perhen. Meanwhile, the sound of Penelope's arrival could be heard. Arnoa and Anakin both became worried and rushed outside to see her. Arnoa inquired. What happened, Penelope? Lady Penelope? Penelope, holding a bucket, threw water on Belle, who stood drenched. Spotting Arnoa, Penelope exclaimed, Oh, your majesty! She then warned, Watch out, your majesty! This scoundrel was inside your bedchamber. Fluttering her arms, she urged, Call the guards! I will hold him off! Anakin and Arnoa exchanged shocked glances before bursting into laughter. Anakin commended her, Excellent job, Lady Penelope! As the advisor of the Empress, I sincerely appreciate your wariness. Bell, in rage, retorted. Shut up, Anakin. Arnoa clarified to Penelope. That scoundrel is my guest, Penelope. Bell, still drenched, stood calmly as Penelope apologized. Oh, my apologies. Bell reassured. It's fine. Arnoa then addressed Bell. There is something I wish to consult you about, Bell. Bell shook his head as he sat on the sofa removing the water. Arnoa offered him a towel and asked, Are you all right? He replied, I am annoyed, but I'll forgive her because she serves you. Bell began to rub the towel on his head as Arnoa questioned, What brings you here anyway? Bell immediately asked her, Aren't you happy to see me? He added, You seemed to be happy when I came to you in cat form. Arnoa replied with a smile, I am delighted. Oh, you! You must be the only one who can freely go in and out of the Imperial Palace. Bell leaned towards her and asked, What was the thing you wanted to talk about? Arnoa extended her hand towards him and said, I want you to attend the noble meeting tomorrow as the Lord of Perhen and declare that you will keep Duke Rickle in check. She added, Other than the Grand Duke, the Lord of Perhen is the only one in the Empire who can match the power of Duke Rickle. Of course, this is not an order. I'm asking you for a favor. I don't intend to force you if you don't want to do it. I can always find another. Bell leaned closer and agreed. I'll do it. He grinned and added, However, I also have something to request of the Empress. Arnoa was surprised and asked, What is it? I didn't expect you to say yes. Bell continued, Allow me to join that barren vent or something when he goes to the palace of Kessman. As he rubbed the towel on his head, Arnoa agreed. Sure, I'll allow it. But why do you wish to go to Kessman? Bell replied. There is someone I'm searching for. I can't tell you about the details, but I've finally come across the trail I've been pursuing for a very long time. Arnoa laid out the conditions. There are three conditions. Firstly, Leave the negotiation with the King of Kessman to Baron Vent. You're just there to follow along. Secondly, you must help if Baron Vent requests it. Okay, if he requests. She added with a smile. And lastly, if I say I need you, you must come to the Imperial Palace immediately. I wish you a safe journey. Bell rose and began to leave, stating, I'm leaving. Arnoa bid him farewell, to which he added, how could I not come if the Empress calls for me? Isn't there a law against that? He pondered. What a peculiar farewell, 
wishing me, the master of the enchanted tower, to be safe. Meanwhile, Baron Vent, though initially baffled by the recognition of his opinion, quickly accepted the command, viewing it as an opportunity to end an unnecessary war. Marquis Dubert, along with other nobles from the Grand Duke's faction, arrived to protest. In the meeting room, Anakin informed Marquis, In matters concerning the imperial family, a sorcerer becomes the messenger. Marquis was astonished and asked, What kind of law is that? Bell later discovered that Anakin dealt with that situation through legal and diplomatic means. A few days later, in the backyard of the palace, a dining table was adorned with food and fruits. Arno arrived while tossing a coin and said to Anakin, Thank you for your coin, Anakin. Anakin followed her and replied, I shall not go down so easily in the next round, your imperial majesty. You saw right through my poker face. Arnoa clenched the coin in her hand and remarked, I've known you since we were children. She swished her hand on the table and continued, Did you notice that Penelope really became the queen of high society? She has not reached the level of influence that Empress Anastia once held but she has rapidly established close ties with many young nobles. It's quite remarkable. Arnoa then asked him, Do you think her age makes it difficult for her to build relationships with the older generation? Anakin replied, There is someone else who exerts influence over the older generation. Countess Herman, who has maintained her house for over 40 years, has been one of the most well-connected people in social circles since she was young. She was not only associated with powerful figures across the continent, but also held remarkable influence in the realm of entertainment and the arts. Arnoa then asked Anakin, You don't think she'll cut ties with Grand Duke Asselier, do you? He smiled and replied, It's hard to say. After observing the alliance between Your Majesty and Duke Rickle, as well as the reaction of Marquis Dubert, she has already become more cautious. Even though she is merely keeping her distance from the Grand Duke because she still wants to marry off her nephew to the Grand Duchess. Anakin whispered in her ear, This is a personal opinion, but her cough seemed to have gotten severe lately. What if? Meanwhile, someone called out, Your Imperial Majesty. As Arnoa and Anakin conversed about Countess Herman, someone called out, Your Imperial Majesty. It was Countess Herman, accompanied by a man. She was wearing a stylish blue dress. They both bowed before Arnoa and said, There were so many people around earlier, so it's only now I can properly greet your majesty. Countess Herman then introduced the man beside her. This is Marquis Bethaniel. He insisted on greeting your imperial majesty. Marquis Bethaniel began, It's an honor to meet your majesty, the newly crowned empress. I have traveled from my domain to meet you. Arnoa and Anakin were momentarily taken aback. Arnoa reminded herself, Marquis Bethaniel, as he owns the most fertile lands in the East, his wealth is among the most notable of the Empire. I was already thinking of building a suitable friendship with him while Grand Duke Asselier is away. She pondered, but what prompted him to travel so far just to see me? Nobles with wealth and homes far away often exhibit a particular arrogance as they believe their taxes contribute significantly to the imperial treasury. But is the Marquis being arrogant toward me right now? She answered herself in the negative when she saw him sparkling with happiness. She thought to herself, Actually, it seems like he's trying to win my favor. The Marquis probably begged Countess Herman to introduce him to me. Marquis Bethaniel then expressed, Your Majesty, if it's okay, I would like to invite you to the Bethaniel Manor in the capital. Arnoa and Anakin were both astonished. Arnoa thought, I'm not quite sure what he's after, but it might be a chance. She smiled and replied, Very well. I shall set the date. Marquis Bethaniel expressed his gratitude. I'm forever grateful, your majesty. Then I will take my leave. I'll be waiting for your letter. They departed from the scene, and Arnoa turned to Anakin, asking, was the Marquis always so friendly? Anakin replied, Not at all, your majesty. He's a scholar who immerses himself in history, so he's not inclined to engage with others. Some even call him the cold hermit of the East for always staying alone in his giant manor. 
Anakin speculated. Perhaps the spring that bloomed in his heart is responsible for his softened attitude. Arnoa inquired. Spring? Later, Arnoa arrived at his estate in a horse carriage, wearing a black dress. She clicked her black heel as she observed the palace and uttered. The rumors about his wealth were true. Anakin, accompanying her, grabbed her hand and remarked. His manner surpasses Countess Hermann's in size and is said to be second only to Grand Duke Asselier. While heading inward, Arnoa commented. His manner is quite lavish, too. Is it all to impress his lover? Anakin added. Who could blame him? She's his first love. A wind started blowing along with leaves, and Arnoa thought. The romance between a commoner from Beetle and Marquis Bethaniel, huh? The kingdom of Beetle became a vassal state of the empire five years ago. It was a small country that covered the coast and extended to several islands. Although it was small, it was populated by a large number of people. However, due to false rumors, citizens of Beetle have not fully integrated into the empire even five years later. The rainstorms have gotten more frequent since they joined the empire. There were rumors like, People from Beetle worship a strange god and are capable of cursing those they hate. Although all the stories about them were false, the rumors were given credence by their unique appearance characterized by pale skin and water-like hair color, and they will pull you under the water to die if you go swimming with them. That seemed to prove the legend claiming they are descendants of the god of the sea. Their unmistakable appearance and their habits from living by the seaside appeared alien to the citizens of the empire leading to their ostracism. Arnoa added, If Marquis Dubert hadn't spread damaging rumors about Beetle as a way to exalt Grand Duke Asselier's military merit, perhaps they wouldn't have been shunned to such an extent. Arnoa was deep in thought when someone called her. Your Majesty! It was the Marquis, rushing towards her. His servant called after him. Marquis Bethaniel! But he didn't listen. The Marquis began. Your Majesty's gracing of my modest estate is truly an honor. Please follow me. Arnoa observed his beautiful palace and thought. Modest? Nothing here exactly says modest. She sat at the dining table along with the Marquis, picking up a cupcake and examining it. The Marquis welcomed Arnoa, saying, Have a seat, Imperial Advisor. Even though there's not much, please help yourself and enjoy. Arnoa replied graciously. I shall remember your kindness. Isn't this from a renowned patissier? The Marquis apologized. My apologies, your majesty, but would it be permissible for one of my acquaintances to join us? Arnoa granted permission, stating. Permission granted. The Marquis became happy, expressing. Thank you, your majesty. Meanwhile, a girl arrived wearing a blue and white royal dress with blue hair. My name is Violetta. She bowed before Arnoa. Arnoa replied, Have a seat. And Violetta sat down, saying, Thank you, your majesty. The Marquis leaned towards her, taking a sigh before speaking. The reason why I have invited your majesty is because I have a humble request to make. Lady Penelope's debutante ball was very impressive. Holding it at the Imperial Palace truly made it memorable. Arnoa added graciously, Thank you. It was the debutante who made it so special. While holding Violetta's hand, the Marquis continued. So, um, since the old days, it has been said that a true man makes the woman by his side happy. Like Lupian I who only loved one woman, even though it was acceptable for him to have many wives at the time. He added nervously. I wish to organize a glamorous debutante ball for Violetta like you did for Lady Penelope. Please grant me this wish, your majesty. Arnoa clinked her tea and replied, In the past, there were nobles who paid for using the imperial palace to throw debutante balls for their daughters. She added firmly, However, I don't intend to allow such liberties. Penelope was able to have her debutante ball at the imperial palace because she's my family. I understand your desire to give your lover a chance to socialize with the nobles, but I cannot grant such privileges to just anyone upon request. Arnoa stated firmly. The Marquis's expression shifted to unhappiness. He began to speak, but before he could, Violetta gently grasped his hand and interjected. 
Listen to her imperial majesty. The fact that I've met you alone is more than enough to make me happy. I mean it. I'm fine. Violetta assured the Marquis, who was now tearful. He squeezed her hand tightly and turned to address Anoa, saying, You don't need to do all that for me. Your Majesty, please allow me to tell you my story. If you still decline after hearing it, I shall never request it again. Anoa considered for a moment before replying, All right. Go on. And with that permission granted, the Marquis began recounting his tale, starting with, it was last summer. Marquis began by informing Arnoa about Violetta. As you're aware, Beetle met its demise around five years ago and was subjugated under the Empire. By order of the Empire's commander-in-chief, all the citizens of Beetle migrated to the heartlands of the Empire. I sought to research the history of Beetle and acquired a seaside villa to reside there for a while. One day, while I was aboard a ship enjoying the sea breeze, Someone covertly set fire to the back of the ship and fled. Just when I thought I was done for, Violetta, who was on board to help with the voyage, saved me from the flames. She jumped into the sea and swam for an hour, all while holding me. I fell in love with her after she saved my life while risking hers, so I asked her to be my lover. Marquis embraced her tenderly and said, And my sweet Violetta was kind enough to have me. Violetta responded, you were cute. Marquis gazed at Violetta and continued. However, a problem arose after that. Rumors began to spread that a mermaid, descended from the devil, is seducing me to take over my house. Upon hearing this, Arnoa was astonished and exclaimed. Did people actually believe in such nonsense? Anakin chimed in. It was a rather specific rumor, your majesty. The neck of the mermaid is branded with the mark of the devil. There are people who witness the Marquis being dragged into the sea, and so on. He added, Even some of the nobles thought it was real. With a somber tone, Marquis said, It turned out the rumors originated from one of my vassals who wanted their daughter to marry me. I had them beheaded according to the imperial law, but the rumors of my alleged devil worship continued to escalate. He looked at her while saying, Violetta has a permanent burn on her body but we're keeping it a secret because we don't want to give the rumors any more fuel. Violetta nodded her head, revealing her burn as she moved her hair aside. Marquis clenched his hand in anger on the table, asserting, She got this scar from saving my life, and I will not sit and watch while people gossip about it. Arnoa interjected, stating, So you wanted a debutante ball at the Imperial Palace as a way to elevate Violetta's name in society while suppressing the rumors about her? With a sniffle, Marquis agreed. That's right, your majesty. He continued. After seeing Lady Penelope's debut grab everyone's attention, I thought that if Violetta established her position in high society like that, the folks of my dominion might cease to believe such rumors and come to admire Violetta for her beauty and her affectionate nature. Marquis broke into tears as he expressed this. Arnoa reassured. A debutante ball at the Imperial Palace is not the answer to your problem. Marquis sighed and replied, I know, your majesty. I'm sorry for asking. Arnoa added with a smile. I meant you don't have to break the rules and the tradition of the Empire when there is a much better solution. Meanwhile, in a bar, a boy sat on the floor, visibly scared, while his boss scolded him. You absolute donkey! How are you even incapable of washing the dishes? Do you know how many beer glasses you broke? The boy replied. I'm sorry. I have never worked at a tavern before. His boss, with a shaved head, yelled. Is that right, princess? You're about as useful as a waterproof tea bag. You got fired from the theater because you couldn't memorize your lines, didn't you? You can't even take orders right. The boy pleaded. I'm truly sorry. If you could just give me one more chance. His boss, hitting him on the floor, retorted, I am done giving you chances. You're fired. After being fired, the boy moved while sobbing and crying to himself. I was once a renowned actor in Duran, but now, I'm just a nobody. After I got exiled from Duran, I became a laughing stock in the Empire. He remembered his audition at the Imperial Theater, where he stood on stage and introduced himself, saying, 
It's an honor to meet you. I'm Louis Edward Bolognius Leonardo Abigail de Vallon. I was once a renowned actor in Duran. The manager scolded him. What kind of name is that? We're not hiring comedians. Get out of here. Once more, he began crying while thinking. Is Duran even a real kingdom? An idiot who changed his name into every name he thought was cool. As he walked, someone called out to him, and he turned back, thinking. What did I do to deserve this? Huh? The person in the black outfit asked him. Are you Rick Tavian? He hesitantly replied. Uh. Well, yes. Who? Before falling down. Someone else said. Is it him? Rick flinched and started begging. W.H., what do you want with me? I swear, I didn't do anything. Please spare my life. The person asked him. Do you recognize me, Rick Tavian? Rick, astonished, stammered. H.M.? Pardon me? When the person revealed herself to be Arnoa by slipping the cloth from her face, Rick recognized her and exclaimed, You're the Queen of Duran! Arnoa drew her weapon, and he quickly corrected himself. And no, the Empress of the Empire! Anakin whispered in Arnoa's ear. He seems a bit dull. Are you sure he's the right person for the job? She sighed and replied, Believe it or not, he's not a complete idiot. Arnoa then asked him, do you know why I brought you here, Rictavian? Would you like to be on the stage again as the main character? The next day, Arnoa and Anakin observed the rehearsal in the theater room. Arnoa complimented. The rehearsal is going well. Anakin replied. I'm glad you approve, your majesty. The practice has been going smooth. Frankly, I was worried when your majesty told me that I can beat him until he could act properly but he's been practicing day and night all by himself. It seems like my advice worked like a charm. Arnoa added, You're there to take all the blame. It's your fault if other actors fail to act. It's your fault if the crowd isn't convinced. Anakin responded, You're in charge now. Your acting is too much, by the way. Study acting more before you teach someone else. But you'll get fired if you upset other actors. With literal fire. You will be burned. Meanwhile, Marquis and Violetta arrived. Marquis expressed, I can't even begin to describe how much I appreciate this, your majesty. Arnoa asked him, Did you like the rehearsal, Marquis? He seemed happy and said, Like is an understatement. Violetta and I will never forget what you've done for us. Violetta chimed in, Once this play ends, the perception of the people toward Beetle surely will change. Arnoa shrugged and remarked, We still have half a month left until the premiere. With excitement, Violetta added, Even without a proper stage set, it was amazing. And Laura is an old friend of mine. My heart filled with joy when I saw her act again. Marquis interjected, I know that your majesty assisted in this matter not just for us, but for the people of Beetle. What benefits them benefits Violetta, and she is the most important person to me. He continued, looking at Arnoa. If I can quiet the disturbing rumors about Violetta and the people of Beetle, and if it enables her to live with dignity in the Empire, I would gladly give up everything. Arnoa paused and asked. Everything? 